And uh, I know who's going to show up. There's a couple people watching already. One of them's right over there. Um, so there's a there's a camera right right here. Yeah. There's a camera right there, and then there's that one sitting on the table, <laughs> and that one's sort of mobile, so we can move it around. But I mean, really, you're a hardcore live streamer. Then. Yeah, I've been doing this for a few months now. Just just for the past few months, I'm starting to hang out. <laughs> but uh, we I have we have a forum, right? And called well, HTM forum. I don't know if you guys remember it, but. Uh, I, I post everything on there, and there's a we've got a I've built up a nice community of people um, that go to this forum. We've got over, you know, I can't tell who are real members, you know, but probably a thousand real people. This is on Twitch. No, this is just a forum on oh. uh, on the internet. On Twitch, uh, there are people following me, but only a few. Hours. I thought Twitch was like for gamers that I, have people watching yeah, their videos. It is. It is. It is. Isn't that crazy? So uh, what we what I figured out was, and that wasn't me. This is there's a there's a bunch of people. So here's what happens: Twitch realized Amazon bought Twitch. They own Twitch now, but Twitch realized because they were software engineers that they could um, just like the gamers were doing live coding or doing live playing, they could do live coding. And so some people started to do live coding and using the same gamer setups to program and and like interact with people in the chat room. Yeah. And it's sort of catching on. So now, usually when you when you when you broadcast on Twitch, you pick a game that you're playing. Now there's a game called Science and Technology. No kidding. No kidding. So you can go in there, and there's a bunch of educational um, channels in there. Um, there's one right now that's a neuroscience channel. That if he, this is funny, because a lot of these guys they'll they'll educate, they'll go through slide decks, and then they'll play a game for an hour. <laughs> they'll like play a video game for an hour, right? And just. The, the it's <laughs> really nice well. So I was watching your your session on, on Twitch, and my fastest old uh, son come to me and said, "Oh, father, you're on Twitch! Great!" Yeah. <laughs> Imagine what my kids did. Right? <laughs> hey, Ryan, you look familiar. Good to see you. You're on. We're live, by the way. Okay, <laughs> just gonna make sure. Uh, Ryan McCall's been a part of our community for quite a few years now. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to see people. I, we haven't had a like face-to-face -face meetup in a long time. Since so. that one in the fall, yeah. Yeah, I was way remember. back up at a, in a different place. It was like a hotel. A hotel. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, good to see so, you. So you do an incredible work this this community. Thank you. Yeah, right. It's That's transparency cool. and then sort of basically there is no barrier. So anyone who wants to know more. And, and, so, and, and your amazing videos on YouTube. So. Yeah, thank you. The, so, the Twitch has really helped because I can generate a lot more content now. You know, uh, which reminds me, of, there's people in the chat room. Can you guys hear? I'm, I'm assuming you guys can hear. Sometimes people will tell me a minute in, your mic's muted. You know, <laughs> I think everything's working now. Uh, I always have to double check because you never know. Sounds fine. Okay, so there we go. <laughs> so somebody's there. <laughs> I can tell. Um, I get. I start get to know, getting to know people too after a while. Um, like this person has their own interesting channel. A lot of people have their own Twitch channels. You know, th this is the chat room. And you can tell. This isn't quite updated. That looks old. But anyway, uh, we'll see all the chats pop up there. So. <clears throat> Let me go greet some new people and let them know that we're streaming. I'm trying to pull people in here to hang out so that uh, we can discuss things, you know, in a public fashion. That's the cool. So, <laughs> there's a yeah, there's, so there's three, okay. three cameras and they're just sort of rotating. So, All right. so you'll get like there's a whiteboard cam and there's this cam which is mobile and I'm, I haven't decided what I want to do with it yet. And then there's this one in the corner. Um, so yeah, we're streaming now. It looks like five people are watching, and there's a there's a handful of people that will uh, tend to show up and will ask questions and stuff. Talk about that problem was good, but it's not the way to make pride or something. You think we're gonna get 20 people in here, huh? Yeah, we can get 20. Yeah, people. there's sure 20 sit, there's 20 chairs. Do we need that turn down? Is it is it sun? I think it's sun. Oh uh, yeah, let's pull it up now. now. I did that so I could steal your stool. That's okay. 
hierarchical Yeah, uh, yeah, there is. Pizza yeah, will be here momentarily. Uh, you, uh, you can take... And hey, is that Ryan over there? Hey, hey Jeff. How you doing? <laughs> you look different. Excellent, yeah. You're missing something. Age. Yeah, I think you decided to get rid of some stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, how you doing? I recognize your face. I actually didn't recognize your face. I recognize oh, so you heard me in that modality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, that's a familiar, familiar voice. Um, By the way, there's coffee cups. I love your coffee cups. I actually got some wine. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's I'm riding my bike home later, so I better not drink much coffee. So. <laughs> but the coffee cup will help me with the papers because they're all. Yeah. That's the example of all the things. Right, right. Yeah, we're using the coffee cup. It has become the symbol yeah. uh, for a lot of stuff. So I'm going to talk about what our current uh, directions are right now, so taking our biological theories and how we're going to migrate them into machine learning. And uh, we have a pathway to do that, sort of. Um, and we started down that path. So I, I wouldn't say it's a middle ground. It's more like how you merge these two fields together. You know, and, and a lot of the work that's going, a lot of people in the deep learning world are saying, hey, we need some new ideas. We have to get some inspiration from the brain. Some people are talking about him. He's talking about his, his capsule networks. Or, which is the idea of adding locations and reference frames to um, to uh, deep learning networks, and that's what that's what we know the brain is doing now. We know the brain is built on these reference frames, and so there's a sort of a, 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 a middle ground where right? there should be a point where the, everybody agrees about the same thing. So is it is it like taking the last layer of a of a neural net and somehow you know wiring it into? No, no, no. <laughs> It's it's like it's messing with the layers though in a way to to introduce sparsity. Well, that's the first step, it's, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the classic neural networks are very simplistic in so many different ways. Um, that doesn't mean they're not useful and that they're really powerful. They're just not brain-like at all, and most people think they're not you know, intelligent-like at all. They don't incorporate any concept of um, movement, inherent movement in the, in the systems, and um, they don't incorporate you know the sort of uh, so many things we know about now. One of the first things that Tubitai and Lewis and, um, and Lucas are working on right now is to take some of the more fundamental aspects of brain science, like the, the, the goal of sparse activations and sparse representations playing in the brain, and apply those to neural networks. You can take existing co composition of neural network, deep networks, and apply sparsity to them. And uh, I'm going to try and try get Lucas. <laughs> and um, and you can say, say, okay, some of the benefits that brains get from using sparse representations, can we add those to um, traditional neural networks? Not, not changing nothing else, and this can you get them to perform better. And but that's just the first step on on this multiple steps that we have to get to eventually. Um, that's an easy one. Right? It's easy. It's one of the easier ones to do. So uh, that's Sudeis. Sudeis. He's, he's going to be here, right? He said he was going to be here. He's yeah. not here right now. Well, it's not seven now. Ah, uh, so. I know. We're a bit early here. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he said he's going to be here. Yeah. We should introduce Lucas, though. Lu Lucas, is it, let me say your name wrong. Osuza? Souza, yeah. Osuza. Okay. Is it Osuza or just Souza? Just Souza. Just, just There's Soza. no name for no. Does your middle name start with an O? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's why I thought it was an O. I thought it was an O. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, he just started as a machine learning engineer for us. Yeah. And Donna, he just flew in from Brazil. Just, just, just like Hi everybody, you know, Donna. Yeah. And, uh, you're you're on you're live. We're streaming right now. So All right. somewhere. Uh, what is it? Yeah. How come yeah. I'm on the camera then? Well, it just switches every ten no. seconds. Oh, does it really? There, oh, there, oh, there, oh there's good. 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 <laughs> I don't know everybody. Okay. Is there a CEO, watching? Donna Davinsky? Is anybody watching? There's six people watching. Okay, hi, six uh, people. <laughs> well, on YouTube, there are going to be a thousand people. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> are they going to show up later? Uh, yeah. So, do they really exist? I mean, that's, I don't know. Come they on. comment a lot on YouTube. Uh, yeah. Are they really <laughs> here if they don't show up later? Oh, that's, yeah. too, that's too deep. What's, which is reality? Yeah. Now we're YouTube. <laughs> So have any of you guys watched Man on Twitch at all? Yes, yes, we have one. I watched the replays. 
Watch the replays. Okay. Watch the replays. Tonight is the Warriors game. I hear about. Oh, I know. Tonight's the Warriors game. I didn't plan that very well. Yeah. It wasn't my fault. Did you this is, is this guy's fault. Put it out of the little window in the corner right there. You're James, right? Yeah. Okay. This is the. Come on in. Oh, oh yeah. You're on. If you want to be on the live stream. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> this is James Weekly. He's come from Australia, right? And, and, just uh, this. Yeah, just no, this. Oh, okay. no, it's, if anything, I couldn't. It's, the, okay. it's the other way around, I think. Yeah, <laughs> this basically, I think he kind of triggered this. He triggered oh. this. Oh. He's like, I'm going to be in town for something, let's oh. get together, and we're like, let's get together. Oh, okay. well, welcome. So, we need to get people to walk in that door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're clocking. Uh, we're clocking. Uh, we're clocking. Uh, we're clocking. Just, we're just set it up the there. Yeah. This feels like so formal. It would be good. Well, yeah. yeah. when the pizza comes, we'll all file out. Oh, okay. It's already here, so we'll file out. We'll get casual. We'll come back in here for another presentation later. Okay. I'd, I'd rather it be cozy than sparse. That's <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, I you hated that. Didn't you? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, you know, I don't want to start too soon. I wanted you guys to just, you know, have a conversation. But let me introduce <laughs> Marcus Lewis first. He's, Hi. If anybody don't, you don't know who Marcus is. I don't know who Marcus is. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, if you follow our work closely, you'll know who Marcus is. <laughs> yeah. If you I mean, don't follow I'm, our work at all, then you won't know any of us. I'm like the fourth most famous uh, new mentor in the room. <laughs> 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 um, there's also, but, we're, but we're working to change that. Yeah, are, are we? Up on the rain. <laughs> and there are behind the scenes engineers, Lewis Shankman over here. He does a ton of excellent work for us that and doesn't take the credit for it. And I just want to give you some of the credit because yeah. he does a lot of stuff for us behind the scenes. Um, do you, is it cool if we go around and maybe, if you want to, give, in, give an introduction, tell you where you're coming from, what, what you do, and why you're interested Why are you here? Is yeah. it the pizza? Is it the content? <laughs> nah, you know. Start with James. Uh, yeah, so I'm from. Uh, a place just north of Sydney in, uh, called Newcastle, it's in Australia. Uh, I work in uh, mostly software engineering type roles, currently a data architect. Um, and I've uh, read on intelligence, I've followed human for a couple of years, um, jump in and out of forums and because of the time zone difference I watch a lot of replays and you know, listen to the podcast rather than much of the live stuff. Um, but I'm here actually for a data warehousing conference, and um, so in the city, I thought um, I kind of it's weird. I've seen a lot of you on videos and things, and it's real life's a bit, a bit of a weird feeling. Shorter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like when you watch um, you watch a sport or something on TV, and mm. then you see them in person. And it's a bit you get disappointed when you see yeah. them. Yeah. They're handsomer, right? They're handsomer. There's something to screen dust. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, this, when this is setting you up for disappointment tonight, I guess. You know. They say it adds 10 pounds. Mm. But what does? The, the camera. Which means you oh. look really good right now. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, James, did a, you did a plug in for a database. A database I did, play, actually. Right? It's um, the product that I'm in town for is a cloud data warehouse that. Um, is quite extensible, it supports JavaScript um, store procedures. So I ported um, Paul Lamb's JavaScript implementation so that it runs actually in database. Yeah. Um, so you can write a HTM query directly without any kind of in and out of data, which is fun. That's cool, because uh, a database is something that's got a lot of temporal data coming in yeah. and out of it, so yeah. you could potentially use that to do some analysis. Yeah. yeah. So, Brev. Hey, hey Brev. Good to see you, Brev. There's, a, there's a, another introduction I should make. Brev, Brev Patterson, who used to work here at Nemeza as a uh, web engineer. It's good to see you. And he's been, you've been doing a lot of stuff on the forums and writing your own HTM, right? Yeah. yeah. We were going around doing introductions, so I don't want to jump the gun. We so. got Dan. We didn't get Dave. that far. Okay. <laughs> David Galby, I'm an electrical engineer, um, interested in AI type stuff. Not don't know that much about HTMs, but it seems like a promising thing, and so I'm um, just to learn about it. Great, thanks. Do you want to take it? Yeah, I'm Eric from Festival Institute. We do formal methods, uh, formal verification, and theorem proving stuff, and uh, I've been following uh, Numenta's work, just work for a while. Uh, I just find it very interesting. Great. Formal 
formal well, verification. Formal verification of like systems, like 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 the cars and, and uh, we're power doing, plants, or like theorems. We're doing like cryptographic primitives, uh, you know, verifying that they get the right output for every possible input. Oh, interesting. You guys can have come in and yeah. see if you, you want to make sure people don't break the crypto world. Yeah. Is, that, is that right? Yeah, that's one one of the goals. Ah, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that could be a job. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> Marcus, do you have anything you want to say? Or no, uh, yeah, you've heard from me. Although I do remember the feeling that James was talking about of, hey, the real people. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I had the same thing happen. I followed you meant to first time, a time before I came here. So I remember the feeling. I, Feelings um, to do grid cells or something. Or so. would, would the feeling has something to do with grid cells? Yeah. yeah. It may, yeah. The, the, the scale was totally off of my previous math of you all. Well, I certainly remember uh, the Manhattan Hackathon, because I told Jeff, I paid attention to Marcus's presentation, where you all those visualizations. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Brad, we already talked about you. Excellent. Uh, so I'm Paul, and I work at UC Riverside. I do bioinformatics there. And um, I heard about you guys because I had six credits on Audible and I needed to buy a book. <laughs> <laughs> and I like AI, and so I, you know, I was just standing through the AI stuff, and I, I saw this book that I had never heard of before, so I, I listened to it, and i uh, been fascinated ever since. And then I started to, you know, I looked up your website and followed you from there. So. I hear there might be another book. Mm -hmm. No, I hear them. <laughs> you, you guys are discovering so much so fast that fast? You know, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> depends on fast? the definition of fast. Yeah, fast. <laughs> I, I am in the research world, so yeah, I do. Right. Like it's been a recently. slow it's definition. Definitely sped up recently. <laughs> yeah. Seems like you guys got something every six months or so. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's really speeding up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll talk a little bit about the history later too. Yeah. So, Peter? Yeah, okay. So I'm Peter Schramek. I'm from Europe, from Prague. Uh, so I'm here in Bayer for one month because I work uh, for Singularity University. Oh. But that's just uh, some kind of a external engagement. Uh, so um, I'm passionate about AI and uh, neuroscience. So I found Numenta sometime three years ago. So I'm following your research and I explained to Matt that uh, when I first read this, all of your stuff, so I s feel, I really feel that that's it. So, <laughs> I don't know why, but I feel it. So, right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it, it, it came out that um, uh, during the last two months I started forming uh, my new startup uh, around uh, the solution, I call it Y Machine. It's focused on the, 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 the capability to answer the counterfactual questions uh, mm -hmm. using some, some uh, phenomena around the causal emergence uh, and uh, integrated information theory. And I wonder how to, how to use, how to leverage HTM for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. I, I do too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Hey, my name is Tommy Imayo. I'm uh, originally from Finland, where I studied physics and neuroscience. Here I've been uh, nine years working currently on a stealth mode startup. Uh, it's a hardware startup. I do computer vision and uh, data algorithms and stuff like that. Uh, I'm interested in non-conventional AI approaches, different kinds of, especially local learning methods. and. Uh, temporal, or like uh, including temporal as a first class citizen in uh, Is that related to your startup or no? No, well, I can apply, but not, not really directly. Yeah, yeah. Has your startup been in stealth for nine years? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are those two, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess that's it. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan. I'm a back end software engineer working at a startup in fintech. and. Uh, in 2015, I was interning here in Numenta. We were looking at the temporal polar, I think, and representational stability. <coughs> Before that, I was uh, very interested in HTM, do, uh, you know, making experiments for it uh, when I was doing my doctorate. So uh, from there, I came out here, and the rest is history. <laughs> I am uh, Marvin, and um, I'm primarily a kind of graphics game engineer. 
uh, I read about uh, on, I read on intelligence like maybe 15 years ago or something. That'd be about the limit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 15 years old. So. Yeah, it was it was pretty new, and it struck me. Um, except I never, you know, I was still in ga gaming and graphics for a long time. I kind of kind of have a lull now, and trying to get back into uh, AI. AI is a pretty big hot topic, and Mementa is doing a kind of a different approach to it. Um, and I just kind of want to see what everybody else is doing, and trying to take that in and and see, you know, wh wh where's the truth behind everything. So I think I think you guys have a lot of good. Stuff going on, so. Thanks. Uh, before I go on, I just want to let the two of you that just walked in know that I'm live streaming right now. If you don't want to do an intro, that's fine. So, mm -hmm. or, so do you want to do an intro? No pressure. You never intro Sumitai. Oh, Sumitai. Everybody knows Sumitai. I do. You're right. This is Sumitai I want. Hi. It's because I was very late coming in. <laughs> we'll, we'll hear from him later, too. <laughs> So I, I'm Dave. Um, I work in autonomous vehicle simulation and video. So a lot of my current simulation. Yes. So with, with the main intent of trying to figure out how to prove, you know, uh, systems that are built partially with neural nets can be released into the world, especially for safety critical applications. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Red on Intelligence shortly after it came out, and been trying to find time to follow on the edge ever since. Doing all your stuff. Yeah, that'll be the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lewis, can we do an intro? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'm Lucas. Lucas. I work with um, age group machine learning, learning with virtual learning. And I'm here at Meta, I'm on the team, and we are applying some of the HTM principles to machine learning, so we're doing the integration gap on Stock Cloud. And that's our challenge for this year to improve machine learning using the principles we study. Mm -hmm. All right, one more, and then we'll like break and have some food. Yeah, hi everyone, um, I'm Steffen, I'm currently on a research visit here, um, and I'm uh, curious about semi-supervised learning, um, and I'm in deep learning research currently, um, which is why I'm quite interested in, in your work as well. I read on intelligence five years ago or so, um, also looked into your as online courses on HTM, um, and I think it's, it's quite interesting because many um, high-level intuitions are um, might become relevant also in mainstream machine learning at, at some point. So it's it's quite interesting that you kind of working uh, in this direction pretty much um, aside from from the mainstream. So yeah, quite curious about. And where are you here from? Hmm? I'm from Germany. Germany. We're quite an international crowd. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we do. There's international interest in this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I'd like to do is uh, we've got pizza. There's, there's a small fridge with soda in there, and there's also coolers with beer and water, and there's some wine and cookies. So there's, there's food. Just go meet, we'll get some food, talk to everybody. If you want to have some technical conversations, there's a whiteboard right here. So it'll be a great place to have some technical conversations. I'm just going to leave this switch thing on a loop, sort of going between the cameras, just to involve the community. So people can go watch later and see what the topic is. really going to mess up when I'm watching some conversation. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the audio will see. Yeah, the audio will keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Your brains can put those disparate yeah. scenes together, right? How are they getting yeah. pizza, though? They won't get any pizza. <laughs> <laughs> we already have some chatters already. Yeah. So. All right. Um, for you guys on chat, if you want to let us know who you are, you can too. We'll, we'll read the messages. After we get our pizza. After we get our pizza. <laughs> 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 After we get our pizza. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, let's go do some food and we'll come back and we'll Jeff and I have two of them. I have this but please don't touch any of this stuff. Don't push the brain. You can touch the brain, yeah. Yeah, it's it's the brain. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I didn't realize it was going to happen. Yeah, I kind of said it. 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 Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, I don't like that term uh, because I think it's a false goal. 
why she have she's the intelligence is not defined by human intelligence. That's my point. Um, and to understand what fundamentally means is human, to be intelligent, and then you can say lots of humans to be intelligent, but things that aren't like humans like all. I don't even know things that humans do. And of course human intelligence is not a single thing that everybody has to be intelligent. So I think the general goal that's wrong. The the question, the more relevant question is, when will machines have the same uh, underlying principles of operation as the human brain as they get that underlying intelligence? So that we can say something is unequivocally intelligent, whether it's human-like or not. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the answer to that question uh, in the problem in the process of writing a book right now. And um, I think part of it is based on the work we've done here. Part of that is defining exactly what intelligence is, what it takes to make a machine intelligent, how would we measure that, and if it is true. Um, and um, none of that has to do with human level performance. You know, if you ask the question, I think the, the basic, even just three years ago, I wouldn't have been able to answer what is the basic framework for an intelligent system. Uh, but now I think I can, I agree with that clearly. And um, so it's a really big breakthrough from about three years ago, and we continue to do now. And um, so how long will it take to implement that silicon is very difficult to say, or in any other software or whatever. It's very difficult to say. Um, uh, it could be, it's certainly not 50 years, it's probably much less than 20 years. It's probably in the order of uh, anywhere as short as I can imagine would be like three years, or as long as I can imagine would be like 10 years. Um, so that's a pretty big range, and um, where it falls in that range is very difficult to say. No, I, no I, I think that's again you're thinking like human level stuff. Yeah. Um, the the hyper intelligence I'm talking about is basically you know the whole theory. What makes a system intelligence is has a general purpose model for it. And that model has to be learned. Um, it has to be learned through sensory motor interactions with the world so we understand this. Um, um, this is not just a whole you know, law. We understand the opposite going out of the brain. And so it's all about building a model. In your head, you have a model of everything around you. You know what pizza is, you know what rooms are, you know what computers are, you know how to operate things, and doors. I mean, it's an incredibly complex model that you just don't experience. You only experience these things because your brain has a model of these things and knows how they react. And everything has got a location in the world. It's a very complex model. It's all stored in the neurons of your neocortex and some other parts of the brain. So that is the essence of intelligence. To get to the point of something that can write software on its own, that's an interesting question. Does it have to know uh, human languages to do that? Does it have to know English or some other human languages? Does it need to, um, can you write software effectively without knowing uh, human institutions and human emotions and things like that? Um, that's questionable. I don't really know that. Um, yeah, but if I were to say to me, could an intelligent machine be incredibly intelligent about something and be amazingly adept at it? Yeah, definitely. But will it be able to write software? Hmm. It's sort of like saying, could it write poetry? And you know, to write poetry in a meaningful way for a human, you have to have more than just this model of all. You have to have more human emotions and human experiences. And so maybe, maybe I'd be willing to settle for not arbitrary software, but you know, with your own sorting out of the machine. Yeah, I, again, I, I, you know, I, I could speculate on that. I could speculate, sure, why I couldn't do that. Um, yeah, it, I'm talking about that kind of thing. I, I just think that's a, it's a red herring I think of what like. The, the history of technology says over and over and over again that the users of the new technology are people first imagine them to be things that we do today. Mm -hmm. But they almost always turn out to be something completely different. And you know, the first computers were designed to replace human computers, people who sat at desks and did mathematics by hand. Uh, yeah, computers can do that, but that's like zero point, you know, zero 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 one percent of what we use computers for today. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so you know, to ask the question, will computer be able to write software? Yes, it will. Uh, is that the first
first areas that are going to be commercially important and viable, is that, is that the test of super intelligence? And I don't think so. Um, but they'll get there. I just don't know if that's a goal, if that should be, we should, whether we should be viewing that as the first goal. Uh, and the whole purpose of the, our work here and the, what I'm doing in writing about this book is to get people to think and understand what intelligence is and more broadly about what could, uh, it could be applied for or what might not be applied for. And um, certainly you could think about could it write software, you could say could it design computers and could something like that, you know, you know, I don't know, design buildings, um, sure. But um, it just, I don't like to think of it. I don't think that should be our thought process about a goal. Uh, for it because I, I, it's hard to know how the technology can evolve and what would be the first things we have to do if you focus on doing something human centric like that. Um, it can slow things down dramatically. So, do you have like a particular thing you want a, a, a baby intelligence to do? Uh, yeah, no, I have, I, I, it's, it's very fundamental. It's like, um, it's like the, in the 40s when they designed computers. It really wasn't about the particular task. It was about computation in general, the nature of algorithms. Can they be, can you compute something and not compute something? What constitutes a universal learning machine that would not build a universal term machine? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the level I'm focused on right here. Here is the, sort of these fundamental principles of intelligence. And I, I don't have a particular, you know, for here's our first task. Um, and I think that's right. If I I have a particular ultimate task that I think about. Like something that I wouldn't shoot for right away, but something we could ultimately have to shoot for. Um, and, and I use this more as an example than like, this is the most important thing. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people want to like go to Mars and live on Mars. You know, Elon Musk wants to do that, but a lot of people want to do that. I think you can't do that uh, until you've got uh, extremely intelligent robots who can go there and prepare our arrival. Mm -hmm. Can build and repair, and you know, can work in that environment, mm -hmm. terraform, mm -hmm. build, mine, everything that needs to be done to survive there. They have to go before we go, mm -hmm. and those those agents have to work independently. They have to use tools. They have to construct things. They have to solve problems. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is going to ultimately be a very important thing. That kind of thing is going to be very important for perhaps our long-term survival as a species, and also our ability to explore the universe. Um, and so we are unfortunately very uh, bound to Earth in many ways. I don't think we're going to be very happy living anywhere else. <laughs> um, so, you know, I can I put like a long character. I, I think about like what would a long term benefit of a really truly intelligent machine might be. That's one of them. And it sounds like a much harder thing though than just a machine that could break stuff. I disagree actually. Um, I don't think so at all. Uh, you have to understand what intelligence is first uh, to understand um, uh, why, whether one thing is more difficult than another. Well, the problem, the problem solving of, of a robot operating autonomously on yeah. Mars is, yeah. is a much more unconstrained. Well, that's the, that's the, that is the whole crux of intelligence: is building systems that are unconstrained. And the difference, so part of the thesis here, this is not in our paper, if you read our paper, I don't spell this out explicitly, but I have spelled it out in this book I'm writing. Um, the key to making a general purpose intelligent machine is how the model of its role is constructed. And the key to that is how it represents space, how it represents structure or reference frames. Like the way the brain works, it has all these reference frames for everything. Everything you see here has a reference frame around it. Reference frames like an XYZ coordinate frame, you figure it out. Um, it, it robotics is like about reference frames, some computer vision will take your heads. But, but it, you, the fact that you see this board over here, you see me here, and my hand here, the only reason you can even know that those are different positions and distances from you is that the neurons in your head are actually representing those positions. Um, the perception of depth in the world, the perception of position in the world, it's all actually, every single thing is represented by pockets of neurons to, to through throughout the neocortex that represent those locations and a reference frame. So there's a reference frame associated with this room, and you might say, well, where's the table? You say it's in the center of the room. Well, what does that mean? It's relative to the reference frame of the room. It's not exactly an XYZ. I can't point to a number on it, but we know how the neurons do this. Uh, they represent locations relative to reference frames, and 
every, you have reference integral to your body, there's reference integral to the object, every object should define everything. If you read our frameworks paper that came out in December, or January this year, it talks about this extensively. So you should read that. Um, and uh, so the, the, your intelligence is built on this model world. The model world is built on assigning reference frames to everything. This is how the brain works. And that's how you can understand the world. And then the question about um, general purpose intelligence or flexibility, what was the term you used? Uh, uh, yeah, Unconstrained. Um, is how there, you, there are different types of reference frames you can use. And it's important what type you use. You want one that can be applied to many different types of problems. So the, the evolution has discovered this type of mechanism is known as grid cells in the brain. And they represent a reference frame. And it's a very general purpose reference frame. So we can use it for moving our body. We can use it for uh, move, you know, my hand, my fingers, my eyes. We can learn it for, for learning the structure of objects. We can learn to use it for learning language. It's all based on the same algorithm, the same modeling system. And the modeling system is very, very generic. So it's like it's related to physical things rather than it, say mathematics. No, it's both. Oh, that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. It's, it evolved to do physical things. But it, it actually represents mathematics, too. Uh, um, knowledge of any sort is assigned to locations in a reference frame. And those, those reference frames do not have to be attached to physical objects. They can be conceptual spaces. And when, just like you can move between a, in a physical space, like I'm moving this room and I can plan my emotions and activities, and when I move to someplace else, I sense something different. Mm -hmm. When you move mentally through these spaces, um, which is everything is mentally through these spaces, you can move through the space of language, you can move through the space of mathematics. The, the actual, the, the, the process of becoming an expert in something is to take a bunch of facts or observations and assign them correctly in a reference frame which has behaviors. And so when I'm a mathematician, um, if I want to go to math, I have to walk forward some number of steps to get the number. But in, in the mathematical space, I have operations too, I have behaviors. So I might do something like, oh, I'm going to multiply, I'm going to divide, I'm going to use a Laplace transform or something like that. These are behaviors which move me to a new location in this reference frame, then there's new facts there. So I can take one sort of equation, I can take an equation, act upon it, and now I have a new equation. And how do we assign yeah. those to left and right and right 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 <laughs> So this is a pretty deep theory. And since you don't know the basics of it, it's going to be hard for you to absorb this in one sitting. Um, so if I want to talk like to read that paper and why don't you get about it right now. Talk to um, you should be in there. Yeah. But <laughs> the yeah. brain tells sure. us. I've got a living paper. I can put it right on the way. The way the brain does mathematics, the way the brain does everything, the brain does everything, it's based on the same. I haven't done this in a while. A um, couple of years. Okay. Okay. So yeah, it's been, I haven't yeah, it's been a couple of years. What I used to run <coughs> um, hackathons. Oh yeah. Two a year. I did that for three years. I think we did six hackathons starting in 2013. But we went. We we changed our focus from applications of HTM back to research. Okay. Yeah. That's good. I'll um. I'll talk a little bit about this in a moment. So we're going to do a short, you know, presentation. Like yeah. here's here's, the, uh, uh, here's where we're at. You know. Yeah. Let's. I think I kind of paid attention to you when you were kind of publishing some tutorial videos, and then I don't know if they yeah. stopped or if I just stopped noticing them. No, I stopped doing the tutorials <laughs> and started doing educational videos on okay. theory. And that's when the HTM School videos came out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's, those are the ones that I managed. Are you okay. still continuing those? Or? Yeah, I have plans for two more. Okay, yeah. But I, um, <coughs> I think I watched the last one right like now. two years ago, so I don't know. No, no, it was, wasn't that long. Oh. Um, six months. Oh, okay. Maybe eight. Okay, then I. Yeah, and the last one was, it came out with our last paper called Framework, a Framework for Intelligence, how locations in the neocortex are used, whatever. It's our, so I, I'm all caught up to our papers in okay. HTM school. Cool. I need to catch up. <clears throat> but I, I'm not doing those currently. I'm focusing on, I'm working on um, an interactive tutorial on how to build HTM systems. Yeah. And I'm building, I'm doing that on Twitch. So if you watch my Twitch stream, I do that once a week. I work, and people are helping me build it, which is really fun. 
<laughs> so I don't know how to, I'm not very good at React, I'm new, like React.js yeah, is yeah. a JavaScript framework. So there's somebody in the community named David Truman who logs on almost every time and helps me build React applications. Yeah, I was working, I, I had to create some UI stuff and I had to study in React and it was painful. So <laughs> I'm not I'm not a front end designer or front end. I don't, I don't like it either. I still don't like it. I've, yeah. I complain about it all the time. But there's some very cool things. The, the state management is nice once you once you have everything set up. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I like w more working on the back end stuff like and then data processing, data analysis. Yeah. Computer business. Stuff See, like that, so. I've, I've started doing all my data visualization in JavaScript now. Yeah. Ever since I went to the front end, I used to program Java. Before that, I programmed like Fortran yeah. and shell scripts and stuff. And upgraded to Java, learned Groovy, which is a dynamic programming language. And then I was like, oh, screw this Java stuff. I'm, <laughs> I'm a functional dynamic programmer now. Now I'm really dangerous. And then we and then moved to JavaScript, and this has been an awful programmer ever since. <laughs> but um, there's a there's a library called D three JS that I use yeah, yeah. all the time. I love that library because it's a, you basically define a data structure that contains all the information you need for your visualization, and you you attach the logic like directly to the data structure. It's really nice. Did you end up staying with React? What? Did you end up staying with React? Yeah, I did. I, and I fought with that. Like, I went back and forth. I was like, I hate it. Yeah. I, I don't hate it. It's, it's too much. There's no other option. I still hate it. But I'm, I'm using React still. Yeah, I started with it about six months ago. And I remember that feeling of um, you have to shift a paradigm. Yeah. It's quite different. I didn't like it because it felt like PHP again. Because I did a good amount of PHP long, long time ago, and I'm like, I felt like I was writing PHP classes, and and there's no model view controller at all anymore, like, throw that all out the window, and, you know, it was frustrating, I still struggle with it, but, but, but I've gotten to the point where I can create, I just create a rack component, and I know how to get my D3 in the right place, and I do all those interactions in D3, and then all the React interactions in React, and the only complicated part is when, the, when I have to go in between them, and I try and do that just with state, just with React state, if I can. So there's no, there's no events going between the two systems at all. It's just state transfer. That's I, working okay. <laughs> I had a lot of global state and a lot of components, so I ended up with Redux mm -hmm. and Immutable JS. So that was like two paradigm shifts together. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm trying not to get Redux involved yeah. if I can. That, that seems to be the advice is don't yeah. use it unless you find it you have to. I've got a little bit of a taste of it because just this past week I there's I, I needed this component that I want data I want this component to stream data and have all the diagrams on the page update as it's streaming data. So it's like generating data and all the diagrams just update. And so this is I hated doing this, but uh, the guy helping me, David Truman, had me create something called a high order component in React that you wrap your page with and it provide it like injects the data into it. And I'm like, yeah. this is the stuff that I remember being really a pain in the ass when I was like using uh, Spring, like Java world, like dependency injection stuff. It's so funny how the cycle just continues, you know, like this big framework cycle just rolling down the hill and like everything goes out of fashion, comes back in fashion. <laughs> it um, wraps it into it. What, React? Yeah. No, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it, but I'm using it because I don't feel, I feel like there's nothing better at the moment. I Except find unless nothing, unless nothing is what you use. You know? And nobody wants to, you to write your own framework anymore, so. What I like about it is um, the most, I think, is that you can um, restore state to a page really easily. With, if you've used jQuery or something like that, and you were trying to write test cases, you kind of start from the page load and have to work your way to what you wanted the page to be. Yeah, and yeah you start Selenium and, tests. To yeah, do you that, do right? tests and you go click this button, wait, yeah, yeah. that, and, and with uh, React and Redux, you go, here's an object, 
and the page just turns into the representation. So I think that's the type of payoff you get from using React when you have a big team and you've got all these standards. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like a team of one, but I'm also, I want, it's what everyone is using, so I want people to be able to come to it and recognize the structure of it without. Hey, there's Mark Brown, he said hi. Hi, Mark Brown. Hey. I don't have a strong opinion on whether React is good, but one one thing about it that, that annoys me, one one thing that people do with it, they they encourage you, for example, when you have like an edit box or an input box or whatever, um, that you should set the the text of an of a edit box like using state or using like if you have an input whatever you input type equals text or whatever. Um, the idea that, that you're going to use the key presses on that to update some state, and then like on every render, you re-render the text in that box. Yeah. And like when I see that, I'm like, as someone who's worked on a web browser before, I'm like, no, rely on the, the native control to put the text there, and you read it. Don't, don't write it constantly. Yeah. It's, a, it's a terrible idea from like just the, the, the responsiveness of that edit box or that input box. There's just like, there's some things that react the, they t the, those people tell you to do that it's just terrible. Yeah. This idea of no, rely on the browser to don't use JavaScript to set the text of a box. Let the browser's control take the input and just use it that way. There's yeah. the, there's these ways that actually like impact the quality of a page. For example, newmenta.com. <laughs> <laughs> like the search box on our page does that. Yeah. <laughs> this is not something I. Th this isn't the type of thing I rant about very often. <laughs> but when you do. <laughs> do it with gusto. Uh, yeah, that's pretty, it is, the markup that React creates is pretty bad. Uh, is the, it, or is the it, mark, is it the, something that it generates looked, looked awful when I said, no, 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 it was, um, it's like CS, no, I'm thinking something different. I'm yeah, thinking the bootstrap. Yeah, the, uh, that's not, the, the markup's fine, it's just like the page actually being responsive, but like there's one usage pattern. If anything, it's been a couple of years since I've really used React much. I bet like the default usage, the recommended usage has changed, but that that was just insane. Well, if people don't even adhere to like semantic markup anymore if you're using one of these frameworks, and that that's always bothered me. <coughs> like styling things, like lots of page, big big companies do this now. They'll style pages, and you'll see the styles as class names. Okay, it'll have digits in them, and like that's the width of what it's supposed to be. Like some, uh, and it, they're not styling it based on what it is. They're styling. They're they're adding style information that's um, style adding not in the styles should be in the CSS, not in the name of the style. Like the right. styles in the name of the style, and they, these are frameworks doing that behind the scenes. You know, um, but that's again, that's what you do in programming. You just roll through that. And, you, it's like another compile target, you know. Yeah, I'm pretty guilty of outsourcing all styling to, to a framework because yeah. I'm not a, um, not really a front end sort of uh, developer. So yeah, I often end up just with like the Bootstrap default slightly. That's what I use. I use Bootstrap and as a baseline and just work on top, build on that. Yeah. Uh, this is that museum, the old oh, yeah. county courthouse is, is a 
Is that the county museum? We've had an event in there, actually, I think, too. Um, yeah, this is a nice downtown area. You don't live in Hilo, you work from home, then. What? You, you don't live in Hilo because you work no. from home. No. I, I live in Watsonville, which is over in traffic, it's like two hours away. Oh, uh, okay. But tonight, it won't be two hours because I'm leaving. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty bad, actually. Um, the way I caught an Uber from where I was, and that. I thought, yeah, five-lane freeway should be good, but it was like, I think it's stopped up on the slate, actually. Yeah? You know, that, uh, yeah. I'm going to see if Mark wants to get on Discord. He's, I'm going to start it up, see if I can hear him. I don't have speakers set up on my end, Mark, so I'm not sure how, how this is going to sound. Who doesn't in California, you know? 
we were down in Scotts Valley a couple weekends ago, and I couldn't remember where you was there or somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Boulder Creek. That was an adventure. <laughs> in uh, Well, it's so I grew up in the country, very urban. So it was familiar to me because it's a very urban place. It's slow and quiet. No, well, not quite slow and quiet. It's weird. It's got this weird hippie redneck vibe, like which is just weird. Right? <laughs> Um, I liked living up there, but uh, it was it felt really isolating. Isolated, like it was 40 minutes from my house out. In, we lived on Bear Creek Road, like way up. It was 40 minutes, like anywhere except Old Creek, and that just became too hard to bear. I had to drive to Felton, my kids to Felton, and the school buses wouldn't pick up where we were, so like we were constantly commuting everywhere. That can be slow for start in front of you, right? It was really slow. Yeah, so it was, uh, we, we stuck it out for almost a year, and uh, I don't know where our place now. We just moved out of Cupertino from the outside, and it's a lot quieter than the Pretty City is. Yeah. In the first six months, like, it was almost definitely quiet. It was, it was creeping us out. And <laughs> yeah. Depressing. Like, there's no one, nothing to do. No, I know. Now we love it that we're used to it. Cupertino, I like Cupertino. It's a nice town, and it is a quiet town. We have the pledges that are passing by. Yeah, now we're Yeah, I I lived on Wallinger uh, um, and Miller, like right around in that area. Yeah. That was that's a nice area. I was happy there. You were playing in Felden Park and Blackberry Farms. Well, that's Stevens just Creek, sort of the west side. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's a nice area too. Yeah. <clears throat> no, we're having audio problems. It's been a very delayed, broken up echo. I, I do have two. Uh, let me try something. I can try something. There's a mixer. I have two mics on. I'm not sure which one is. Or is this the mic? That's the mic. Okay, so I've got two mics on. I can turn one of them off if that helps, because my good mic, this is my omnidirectional mic, it's probably better. Um, so tell me if that audio sound is better now that I've switched off one of the microphones. I would just have, I can turn on three, but I don't think I should. <laughs> but yeah, Mark, if you're listening to Discord audio and Twitch audio, it's not going to be great. Okay, I'm going to try, I'm going to switch over and try the other one now. That one's quiet. So this one is louder, probably. I did have them both on, and then I can sort of cover both sides of the room. This is this is one side. It's only Discord. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks for hanging in there, you guys. Um, let's see if I can pull everybody in here. So. I'm give a short talk. But let me put my agenda up here. And how do I want to do this? I've got nothing on. Yeah, like, I, I know Jeff's going to. Yeah, I can hear the, uh, the output from my voice coming out much later. I think that's going to get delayed in the Twitch channel. I think that's just going to happen. And what, what usually what people do when they're interacting directly with me is they'll mute the Twitch channel. Interact on Discord, I think. At least when David Truman and I are pair programming, I think that might be what he ends up doing. I've never been on that side of it, so I don't really know what to do. It's a problem for you in terms of slowing down speech. It's first for me. I can hear you. Okay, yeah, this works fine for me. Uh,
I was going to use slides that has too complicated to get the projector involved. We'll just do it all in the whiteboard. I was talking to Bit King on our forum. He's one of our most active and valued forum members. Oh, hi. So you know, you're a community manager. I am a real community manager, yes. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, Okay, thanks for the heads up. <clears throat> yeah, I probably would notice if you didn't if you started just not posting. <laughs> can represent time or importance by the size in the space so so that's, that's really yeah. something uh, I would say so less well time is different I, I think um, so you can mix HTM and grid cells and that's sort of what our sensory motor ideas are doing are mixing ideas do you want us to hustle people in and talk about yeah if they're done I was about yeah. to actually I mean, people were just yapping about I'll, I'll, I'll go do it. <laughs> 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 okay, the messages. 
So I've, I've been managing the community since 2013. Uh, so my big responsibility was a project called NewPick, and that was open sourced in, in 2013. This was my baby for a long time. Uh, we didn't have any releases, we didn't have any compilation, we didn't have any CI, we had nothing when we open sourced. We just made it public. So all there was a lot of work that went into this, and uh, just this past year, I think it was 2018, we have we have put Nubic into maintenance mode. Maintenance mode. Which honestly made me unhappy. Because <laughs> this was my baby for a long time. But there's there, there's a reason for it. This was your idea though. This was, well, <laughs> it might have been my idea, but it was it was inevitable. Okay? We had to do it. So, so it's I wanted, a sign of success. I guess it's a sign of success. So the, it, but the bad thing is this is this is Python 2.7, uh, not right on Python 2.7, and we're we're not going to update it to to, to 3.0. And and what what tends to happen um, with our company is, and I'm going to go back and, and justify this by talking about our mission, because like Jeff said, I was heartbroken by this, but it was also my idea. And and the reason is um, the mission that we have at Nementa. Is, is more important than a software project. Let me get this right, because so our mission is twofold. <laughs> to, to reverse engineer the neocortex, that's a, that's a summation of it. Yeah, that's just Reverse engineer the neocortex, right? And the second is to apply what we've learned, apply our knowledge to create machine intelligence. However, we want to define that a little bit to create machine intelligence. And so, so when you do this, you have to inform. This has to inform how we do that. And then we test it out, and then we go back and say, okay, how, 
how did that work out? So we've got a, a loop here, and what you end up is with a whole bunch of, of research and then a bunch of prototypes. And again, it's this cycle. You, you create things, you test and test and test, you think this is really how it's working, and then eventually you're like, that wasn't exactly how it worked, let's, let's start again and, and build something new. Now if you think, if we go back, and I'm going to need Subutai's brain a little bit here, because I wanted to try and list all the different HTM implementations. Oh, <laughs> I hear a voice. Is that your voice feeding back, or is there someone talking or something? I don't, I don't know. It might be that. I heard the song oh, I don't know. Oh, okay. um, so I know we could start with Zeta 1, or was there something before Zeta 1? Sure, Zeta 1. Zeta 1, and obviously Zeta 2. Was, and then there was something else, I don't remember what it was called, before NewPic. <laughs> we had things like the Vision Toolkit. Right, right. Uh, the vi Vision Toolkit. Uh, that Same was thing. all like the original NewPic 1.0. Now we, have, now we have a new NewPic 1.0. Yeah. That was the original NewPic 1.0. And then that was all proprietary. And then when we open source NewPic, we sort of just threw that over the wall. And here we have this. We took uh, yeah, I, I some it, state of this. Yeah, well, that was also a much older generation of algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's in NewPic today is not that stuff. Right. Uh, this that didn't was all have SDRs and. Uh, yeah, that was all pre and all that stuff. So before we did open source. When did the age of HTM go away? Oh, when did the higher. Well, it's never gone away. Uh, uh, the term HTM or. Uh, I guess I think it's what he's asking is we had hierarchy back here. When did we. We don't have hierarchy necessarily. We never used hierarchy in our NewPic application. So I would say before we open source, we can I try to explain what it means to go away. Yeah. So um, the neocortex, which is our primary goal to understand the neocortex, is traditionally described as having being built of a hierarchy of these regions, and so they're connected. These regions in the neocortex are connected in a very complex way. People talk about it as hierarchical. That's a fact. Um, but the neocortex is also built out of a repetitive element. Uh, called the cortical column, and there's 150,000 at least in the neocortex, and they're virtually identical. And so, what we what we decided to do is to focus on what one of those cortical columns does. If you understand what that one column does, then you can basically understand the whole thing. And so, we just started doing our research purely on that 100,000 neurons and a square millimeter of neocortex. And when we focus on that, we're not thinking about the hierarchy. Uh, so. It's not like the hierarchy went away, it's just we weren't focused on it. Um, so we stopped talking about it as much. Uh, we actually reintroduced it again uh, recently in the Thousand Brains Theory, So, because um, we made progress on the column. Yeah. So it's, it's as a, so anyway, to, to try to avoid this, we stopped calling it hierarchical temporal memory, we just started calling it HTM. It's like, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken is now KFC. So um, <laughs> that way you don't have to ask what's in the right? Does that mean chicken? No. Is everything HTM? Does it stand for hierarchy? No. Does it HTM? That's it. So, uh, but that's the history of that. And that, I mean, we, we, that was before we went to the first We weren't worrying about hierarchy when NIPA came out. Uh, uh, I don't remember the history. I don't remember. Yeah, in between we had this um, uh, sequence memory and spatial cooler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what's in the table. Yeah, yeah. That was not in the table. This was, yeah, the SP, the, 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 the T, well, we called it TP at the time, and then, then the TM came out. Oh, well, they're really good. Yeah, TM. Yeah. 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 Eight years ago, or eight and a half years ago, we had a real breakthrough where we sort of abandoned all the old stuff and we went into this new stuff. And that was the start of the white paper eight and a half years ago, which then it resulted in the, uh, the, yeah. the science paper that's titled uh, Why Did the Neurons of Thousands of Synapses? The Theory of Sequence Memory in the Brain, which has done extremely well that paper. Um, so that was the first time we explained how neurons in the brain really learn sequences and why they make predictions. So at that point, we started over again. And that became uh, the open source version. Mm -hmm. That's where the spatial cooler or the temporal memory came along. And now we started building on that from that point eight years ago. The prior, the prior uh, six years, whatever was, we basically uh, put to bed. Yeah. So, so I wanted to try and come up with, with I'm going to need help from you guys, all the community implementations of HTM. I'm going to try and start back from before we went open source. I know there was one. It was called OpenCLA or OpenHTM. It was it was David Ragazzi and Doug King and um, uh, Resnick, I think, or Mark Odahall. We were working on that. I think that was called OpenHTM 
or OpenCLA, OpenCLA or OpenCLA, something like that. Um, and that was, as soon as we, as soon as Nupit came out, all of those guys sort of jumped on our bandwagon and, and started helping. And many of them wanted to contribute quite a bit to the Nupit, and especially the Nupit core code base. So we got a, nice, a lot of help from those guys helping us get CI running, get tests running, you know, get a lot of the basic software pipelines in place. They helped out a lot. Um, I can't ignore HTML and Java. <laughs> so, <laughs> David Bay put a lot of work into HTML Java. He pretty much went through all the Nupic algorithms, supported everything, um, and that was one of the very first, you know, re real structured implementations that we have. And you could use that as a nice reference implementation. You got it really nicely written and, and uh, uh, good Java coding. Um, okay, uh, so I'm just going to randomly start naming some. There's one in CUDA. There's HTML and CUDA. There's a bunch of C++ implementations. Um, I think there's there's a new one called eTailor from Marty on the forums. This is a C++ implementation that's supposed to be parallel and, and use like tensors as a structure very heavily. Um, so that, that could be interesting. I'm still trying to get it to work. All right, let's do that. Um, I'm missing so many. Come on, somebody, somebody get a point. There's a Golang, there's a Golang eight, eight, uh, implementation. I think Derek Pinto wrote that, and I think it's just called HTML. Composure. <laughs> that, that's correct. Right. Comportex. Comportex, which was uh, Felix. And um, Marcus also used Comportex a lot. There it is. Um, there's, a, there's a C sharp implementation. I know that might just be the spatial cooler. No, this is just the spatial cooler. But there, there's a C sharp implementation. There's, uh, now I'm going to have to look at my notes. There's, uh, oh, of course, there's a community fork, which is currently called nupic.cpp. This has Python bindings, and I've tried them out, both for Python 2 and Python 3. I've run Hotgen in this. So you can run Python 3 HTML code with, with nupic cpp. You have to write a little bit of extra code to, because there's no OPF. There's, there's, I mean, you, you have to, like, Use the rare, the the raw algorithm code to do it, but it works. Um, and then of course there's nubic uh, which is not ready for prime time. It's, I think we're still working on getting it to Python three. And what I think this is going to turn into is something like the OPF, not the OPF, but something like it's some type of framework that makes this exposes this more easily to a certain use case, something like that. At least that's the direction I'm encouraging them to take that. Um, so there's a lot of activity still, and some of these are still really new. You've got, you know, James's uh, Snowflake database plugin, which is interesting. Taking oh, which reminds me, Paul Lamb has HTM.js, which is a JavaScript implementation. He's um, done a great job making that a, a decent implementation. He's got demos online. If you ever, he's got a little piano demo. You can see the notes and you can see the bursting and everything, just like like the HTM school thing. There's a few more JavaScript ones too, like Ian has one. There is, yeah. There's another JavaScript one Ian wrote. Um, I can't list them all. So this is even all of them. And these are the only ones I know about. There's, lots, there's a lot of them that um, nobody ever tells me about, and I'll run into them. And I'm like, where did you come from? <laughs> there's, a, there's a bunch of academic papers that have re-implemented HTML and yeah. you know, talk about different properties of HTML. Well, that's true, yeah. yeah. So that's just an hardware implementation. Yeah, there's a lot of them. So, I mean, it's, it's been catching on. There's a lot more people that know about it and uh, understand how it works and can implement it now, which is great. So that's sort of the open source of, uh, um, evolution of the code at this point. And I, I, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit more about the direction that will continue to go. But I would like to ask Jeff first to talk about the evolution of Fury. Because one thing I'll say, and I'll let you correct me, as soon as I say it. <laughs> yeah, you're always right. <laughs> is that uh, this new pick, everything within it, is, is sort of a, is a different evolution of the theory than what we're doing now, which incorporates motion, right? And yeah. So why don't you talk about it? Okay, so uh, just, yeah, really real quick, right? The number one goal of reverse engineering is in your cortex, right? And that's like 75% of your brain, okay? And it's part of the brain that's about intelligence. And so, um, uh, what our basic approach to that is, is, a, is understanding that the neural cortex, what it basically does is it builds a predictive model of the world. It learns a predictive model of the world. So to understand the world, you have to have a model of the world. 
and that's a very complex model and it's sort of the new neurocortex and it's constantly making predictions of what's going on. So we attack the problem by asking how how the brain can make predictions. And we and there's two reasons that you can think of the brain just getting these inputs, and the inputs are changing, and it's trying to predict the next input. And there's two basic reasons why the inputs change. One one reason the inputs change is the world is changing, the world is moving, and the other one is you are moving. And um, so the, the first one is like a melody. That you can sit there, you don't have to move at all, and the sounds come in, and you can recognize the melody, and you can predict the next note in the melody, or language, and things like that. So, um, you know, a bird flies by, whatever. The other one is the inputs of your, your brain change because you're moving. Every time I take a step here, or turn my head, massive changes are going on in my brain. Massive. And this is. Are you coming up the source of this? Uh, I'm still going to the double. <laughs> so, so, so we t this is because it is based on motion yourself. This, we figured this is the easier problem. So this is the first one we attacked, and that's the thing we figured out eight years ago. Uh, that's the thing that led to the CLA white paper. It led to the thousand, uh, to the uh, um, the whole um, uh, white neurons of a thousand synapses paper. Most of what people think about is HGM is based on this theory here, which is a very small, it's a subset of what the whole new project is. It's a very small subset. But it, it had a lot of important concepts in there. It had the concepts of, in, in, of sparse, uh, the whole theory about sparse representations, the whole theory about the, how neurons use all the synapses to make predictions. It had a theory about mini columns which exist in the brain. So there's a, there's a lot of fundamental stuff happening in this particular discovery. And then three years ago, we made significant progress on the second one. And we figured out the basic trick of what's going on here. And uh, that's a much harder problem to understand. Uh, and, and this resulted now, we've had now had three papers on it, I think, uh, columns, columns plus, and, and framework papers. Uh, there are three neuroscience academic papers, you know, uh, neuro, you know, neuroscience papers about this topic. Um, it's a quite, Fascinating solution to understand how it works. It's built upon this, so basically, if you take this and you extend it, you get that. So these are really tied together. These are not two separate problems. And the solution here really, really was a, is a huge idea. It's about how reference frames are used in the, to model the world. Um, and there's a lot of biological details in that. Right? Um, so we're, we're, we're working on this. And what's happened is we don't think there's enough. This, once we figure this out, and so we understand how like, one of these columns in the cortex can basically build a model, um, basically build a model of a column in the neocortex here. Um, build a model, this little single column can build models of the world just by, by way of movement and so on. Once we figure that out, then you can start figuring out how the whole neocortex works. And that's in our framework paper, which came out in January, which talks about, uh, reintroduces the hierarchy and explains how these, these different models work together. <coughs> This, the, the neuroscience theory, in some sense, this is sort of the, the big thing we had to get to, and, uh, and we're not done with it. There's a lot of things we don't know yet, but the, the big idea is there. Um, and so we're now, uh, we are, we're sort of trying to fill in the remaining pieces. Mostly right now, that's Marcus and myself. Mar uh, Marcus is working full-time on it. I'm working part-time on it because I'm writing another book. Um, but we're sort, of, we're sort of like filling in the details here. We're documenting it. We're trying to uh, sort of wrap it up a bit, um, and and that's where pseudo is going to come up here because once once we're, we can sort of see the end of the tunnel for understanding what a column does and how the whole thing works and the big picture is in place, um, you know, how the neocortex does what it does, and so now we're going to start working on our we started working on our second mission, uh, which is taking these ideas and bringing machine intelligence, and Sudatai is leading that effort. And so, um, and so is Lucas and, and Lewis and uh, uh, our intern Jeremy, who's not here. Um, so we're starting to build up that team and really start taking these principles that are in both of these things moving around. So the company, for the last three years, has been almost completely focused on neuroscience. It's all we've been doing is neuroscience, 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 no machine learning really at all. Um, but now we, in the last six months, we are really just starting to transition from, because the neuroscience mission is, you can see the end of it. Um, and uh, we're starting to move to the, to the second uh, goal, which is the machine learning side. And so we'd like to talk about that. So unless there's any I'm gonna questions stage. about that, you can answer that. But 
Okay. Uh, let's set the stage. Sorry, just do that. Do that. Do that. Oh, I can use that. What was the question? Okay, the question. Uh, yeah, question mark. No? It was. All right. Yeah. Yes, if I was there, I would ask him to sign my copy of On Intelligence. I love it dearly. Thank you very much for writing it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I'm writing a new book, you know. I'm already halfway done. It's, it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's that? Title? Uh, I don't have a final title yet. Right. Should I share working titles? No. Yeah. no. Okay. If, if I was <laughs> Yeah. 
but um, yeah. It's great. Look, we we had told we told fans what's going on in machine learning and and uh, neural networks. Uh, I just think they're going to need to they're going to hit a dead end and they're going to need these biological principles. And a lot of people in the machine learning world are coming to that conclusion as well. So, um, so we're not adversarial at all. It's just um, um, we have to come together. Right through that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, so. And by the way, we have two missions. One is uh, figuring out the operating principles of the neocortex. And so that's what we've been focused on for many years uh, now, just purely focused on the neuroscience. And the second part of the mission is to see how those principles, how we can use those principles to build intelligent systems. Because we think those principles should be at the core of intelligent systems. Um, and we've kind of ignored that mission for quite a while now. And it's, there's always been this question of when do we get back to it? What is the right timing for it? And we think the timing is, uh, the right timing is actually now. Um, and the reason for that is, as Jeff mentioned, uh, there's a bunch of work we've done, and we can kind of see uh, the framework of how the neocortex works. How does, what does the cortical column do? What is its principal operating functions? What are the properties? What are the kind of the algorithms? And the, what are the layers doing? We, have a, we don't have it all figured out, but we see the structure of what it is. And now it's sort of filling in a lot of the details. And we sort of felt that now that we have this structure, we can, there's dozens of principles that are uh, embedded in that big theory. We can now start taking those principles and applying them to practical systems. Um, and we should be able to see dramatic uh, improvements in certain areas uh, of that. So, um, and this is where I'm gonna rewrite what uh, Jeff wrote. So if you think about, first the original. <laughs> Sorry, you have to go through this all over again. Um, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you think about the sequence memory on the original uh, white paper and the CLA uh, algorithms. So, we introduced uh, the notion of SDRs in there. Um, sparse distributed representations. Sparse distributed representations or, uh, and sparsity in, in general. Um, we had a completely different neuron model. Um, so, this is uh, much closer to what real neurons look like. It's nothing like what uh, deep learning neurons look like. Um, and within that, there's you know there's uh, concepts like active dendrites and um, a bunch of other stuff. We had um, an unsupervised actually let me I'm going to use the new term uh, self-supervised. <laughs> I used to use this term ten years ago, and no one could understand it. Now Yang Lekun is using it, so now everyone's using it. So, okay, so we have self-supervised learning algorithms. Um, we had continuously learning algorithms. It's, it's very similar. Um, um, we had very low resolution synapses and, and activations. So we have binary activations. And uh, the core of all of this was to build a predictive model of sequences. Uh, so we had neurons as the, as the core, and we had, uh, as I've mentioned, you know, many columns and a way of, of and, and along with these learning algorithms, there's something called uh, structural plasticity. So we're like, changing the network structure as we go. That's how learning occurs in the brain. These are all biological principles here. These are these are not machine learning principles per se. These are yeah. These are all coming from the neuroscience. Yeah. It's hardcore neuroscience. Um, and in fact, if you talk to neuroscientists, there are studies that show something like 30% of the synapses in your brain, uh, in the neocortex, turn over every few days. So there's amazing rewiring going on in the brain. There's nothing like that in, in deep learning today. Um, so this was all of the uh, core of the original set of uh, algorithms that we released. And with the newer stuff, there's more principles. You know, so we have, uh, have location-based representations. And you know, specifically using you know, grid cells. Uh, we have this notion of composite objects. If you've been following along on our research, uh, of this um, and transformations and uh, probably sort of one of the biggest things that we've done which we published in the columns paper is this idea of column voting or voting across cortical columns and put that in here uh, this allows uh, the cortical columns to very rapidly uh, infer uh, 
what objects it's seeing and what percepts it's seeing based on sensory data. It can do it over time and it can do it over space. Basically. And you know, sort of, if you put all of this together, you get kind of what we call the uh, thousand brains theory. Actually, you might want to, did you, did you leave out movement-based learning on purpose, or? Uh, not on purpose, it's kind of implicit okay. here, but yeah. I just, it's worth uh, mentioning yeah, that yeah. the whole system's built on the idea that it's moving. <laughs> <laughs> you move your sensors, you move your fingers, you move your body, this is all important to the theory. Yeah, one of the most amazing things about cortical columns is that it, cortical column appears everywhere throughout the, throughout the neocortex, but every cortical column receives motor information and it outputs motor information. Um, whether it's the visual areas output motor information and motor areas receive motor information uh, and sensory information. So cortical columns are inherently sensory motor and your entire brain is sensory motor at a very deep level. There's really no such thing as a motor area and a sensory area. Everything's a sensory motor area. So this is really key to, to everything that we're doing. So then there's the thousand brains theory, which kind of redefines how the neocortex works and that redefines how we think about hierarchy and how multiple cortical columns are connected together. Uh, so I'm not going to go through the details of this, but you can read about it in our papers. But if you kind of step back and take a look at this, these, there's a, a huge, rich roadmap of things that are not talked about at all in deep learning that are built out of solid neuroscience principles, uh, built out of studying the neocortex. The neocortex is the only, really the only thing that we can all agree is intelligent. Um, and it behooves us to sort of see how these principles can be then applied to practical systems. And so the, the kind of the mission, so the second part of the mission really involves looking at all of these stuff and starting uh, to apply them to practical machine learning systems and practical deep learning systems. What's interesting is that very recently, um, the, uh, the nature of what people are talking about in deep learning has changed a little bit. Over the last year, people have realized that deep learning has really fundamental limitations. So deep learning systems are not very robust. You can make tiny changes to inputs and tiny changes to data, and you can completely fool systems. So uh, they're not robust at all. You can really fool them. Um, they don't generalize very well. Uh, if you uh, try to train it on something, uh, a new thing, you have to come up with thousands and thousands of examples of the new thing before it's really going to relate. Uh, learn it. Um, this, uh, deep learning systems are not continuously learning. They're not flexible. Um, you have to have a lot of manual tweaking to get any system working well. And so in order to really get uh, a machine learning system well, you have to ship a machine learning engineer with the system to actually get it working. The brain is nothing like that. Uh, deep learning systems are batch trained. They're not continuous learning. Um, you need uh, get tons of label data sets in a batch training scenario to really train them. If you think about all of those properties, it's nothing like the brain. Um, you know, we are very flexible, we are continuously learning, there's no batch training, there's no parameter tweaking, nothing like that is necessary. So I think these principles are at the heart of getting deep learning systems and practical systems in general to work in an intelligent, to be truly intelligent and flexible um, and, and embedded systems in the world. So that's basically the, the mission that we're on. Um, uh, and, and that's how we're doing the second half of the mission, is starting to apply these things to, to machine learning. Um, so far what we've done is very simple. We've just been doing this for a few months. Um, everything that we do is dependent on sparse representations in SDR. So the first thing that Lewis and I and Lucas have been worked on is sort of looking at sparsity in SDRs and how that can be incorporated into machine learning in the same way that we think it's done in the brain. And we've made a lot of really good progress on that later and uh, recently. And so we, um, that's kind of what we focused on. The next step is going to be picking up some of these other things and starting to incorporate them. And it's going to start getting, I think, pretty interesting once we do that. So that's kind of so we're, the, we're not we're doing this all at once. We're, no, we're not doing this all at once. We're a small company. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also, I think it has to be done in a certain sequence. Uh, it, it's not like you know, one person can do binary activation, someone else can do transforms. Yeah. So gonna, it's an integrated system as to work. Somebody asked me earlier, how long is it going to take to get all the stuff done? <laughs> what would your answer be to that? <laughs> Hopefully in my lifetime. <laughs> how old are you going to live? <laughs> Am I allowed to do... Uh, 
substitution of my body? Uh, uh, transplants. Uh, <laughs> and can you uh, mention sort of the targets you're shooting for to apply these these concepts to? Yeah. yeah so so um, if you look at the theory of SDR, for example, um, SDRs allow a representation which are extremely robust to noise and perturbations. So one of the first things we've done is uh, we've shown that that holds true even in a deep learning setup. If you put in sparsity, you get more robust systems. Um, I think sparsity is also key to continuous learning. Um, because what happens with sparse representations is that uh, you get a representation that are really far apart in space. They don't collide with one another. That's why they're robust. And so when you're, one of the biggest problems with continuous learning is how do you learn new things without forgetting the old stuff? And one of the keys to that is sparsity. Um, if you have sparse representation, you learn something new, it's not going to interfere with the old stuff. Um, it's part of our neuron theory. It's part of our, our, our neuron theory. The point you know, I'm using the machine learning model is that all the synapses are very high resolution and all playing a role at once here. In the real one, you can just add the neuron and then a new pattern that have no previous knowledge. You just add new knowledge and it doesn't phase the slides. So I think we want to. Um, have systems, systems that are learning continuously in, a, in an unsupervised or self-supervised setup, we really have to put in a neural model that, that we figured out. So that's going to enable that. Um, uh, what else? Um, we don't have to know the answer. Yeah, the, well, I, mean, I know the answer to a lot of this stuff, but uh, it's just a question of what order to do. I call them voting. I think will help tremendously in robustness. Uh, it will also help, I think, in reducing the number of training examples you need, too, because you can, uh, you're, you're not just learning from the label, but you're also learning in kind of a collaborative, distributed setup. Um, so I think that's been, and, and you can do transfer learning in this kind of a, a scenario, so um, it will help with that. Um, I think figuring out the location-based representations, the key, the, the key concept here is to build an invariant model of objects that's invariant to how your body is oriented towards the object and invariant to the order in which you perceive uh, something. And in order to do that, you need to figure out the location of your sensor in the reference frame of the object. Um, so that's basically what this is. And if you can figure out uh, how to represent objects in this invariant way, you can actually learn very, very quickly. Um, you don't, once you have a, you just need enough information to build a invariant model. Now you don't need to see the model in all of the different positions and you know, rotations and translations and so on. So you can really dramatically reduce the number of training examples you need. Um, you build a very rich predictive model. Um, and this is also key to, I guess it's so good, it's hard. It's key to um, having uh, you know, integrated sensory motor stuff and, and, and making movements and. If you know, if you have an invariant model and you know how your body kind of relates to it and you want to make changes to it, um, you can do that, uh, you know, once you have this kind of model. So there's, there's a lot of different kind of capabilities uh, that you get out there that are hard to do in, in deep learning systems today. Any, any questions? Yeah. Are, you, are you talking about non-sequential style machine learning? Like, uh, no, no, uh, not necessarily. Uh, so, um, you know, the, 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 the thing that we really, in order to get self-supervised learning working in a continuous framework, uh, the essence of it is to build a predictive model of what's happening. Uh, so again, just like Jeff said, there's two ways that you can have sequences. Um, and, and in both of those cases, uh, these properties allow you to build predictive models. So you need, it really applies really well to screening a uh, sequential kind of scenario. And that's what a lot of this stuff was focused on.
project that you're looking at, like painting is fixed and you're fixed, but you're moving your sensor over that object. So this sensory motor interaction, you turn that to a temporal stream and then you learn the structure of the object using all these principles. So even something you might think about is just like image classification and these things are a non temporal problem. Uh, will uh, amend itself very well to these theories. Um, and so that's, um, but you know, ultimately, the, the field of robotics and the field of AI are not separate problems. Uh, so, uh, but even something like simple, like recognizing an image, is a sensory model problem in terms of the brain. The brain you can reference it, but by, you have to learn it that way. You have to learn something by attending the different components and moving over time. After you've done that, the voting system allows you to recognize it without it. That's one of the beauty of one of the big things we have to figure out is how you can recognize something in a flash um, without movement when movement is so inherent to the nature of learning. And the voting system answers that question. Um, it shows how that happens. <clears throat> but learning has to go through like, oh, but if I see a new, this object, I've maybe seen a lot of Coke cans. And I know what it is, and I know it's going to have a label, a logo, and I know it's going to say certain sort of things, and it's going to have a nutrition label. The first time I had to learn that, I had to look at each one of those components and read them and see where they are and build up this model. Now I just so done. I have a question. What, what's your latest thoughts on attention? I know mean, you talked about that a few times. It just was talking about that in some sense. sense. Um, um, the attention is literally, the attention is, 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 is the process of, of um, sort of recognizing the subcomponents of your space around you, the subcomponents of an object. Uh, and as you attend to different components, you actually build up a composite object. And so that's the, the basic structure of what, how we think about attention here. And Matt and I did a little recording about that. But I talked about my thal thalamus theory. Yeah, the podcast on the thalamus. Yeah, that's a really good theory. You might find that interesting. So in the brain, we think about the thalamus is involved in this and uh, the interaction between the neocortex and the thalamus. And so when we think about attention, I, I've been focusing on that biological mechanism, um, which most people believe is involved in attention. And so we have a theory about how that works. Um, it's it's a, the structure of the theory about it. Um, and so it's going to be very, very important to get to these composite objects um, component to it. You know, many of these pieces will fit in and will be a, a key part of that. Um, if you have a, you know, one way to think about it is if you have a, a fingertip and you're trying to recognize an object by moving around it, um, you know, that's a sensory motor inference problem, uh, moving around. Uh, that's very analogous to having your eyes staccatoing around an object and recognizing it uh, through, through motion. Um, and that's a kind of overt attention mechanism. And then there are internal me intention mechanisms that dynamically filter out different subcomponents of the space. And that could be very analogous to your finger moving around. Uh, it's, it's like it's an active process. Uh, it's a sensory motor process of, of figuring this out. I guess I was thinking about attention a little bit differently, and more in terms of say you're looking at a scene, and then you focus on one thing yeah. in that scene because say somebody's got a gun. Yeah, so yeah. That, that question is, that's more of an issue of salient, right? Um, but it's the same process. I mean, you are looking at a scene, and, and, and I've come to understand that as you move around the world, you're constantly, every second almost, you're attending the different thing. I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you. And as you do this, you're building, you, you're literally, the cortex is learning the structure of those things you attend to in the world. I now have an impression of where you are in this room. I didn't have a second ago. I know, you know things, you're just constantly building the structure. Now, this, that is what attention is all about. The second question you're asking is like, oh, well, why would I tend to one thing versus another? Why? And so there is an issue of sanity, why certain things you might jump out at you and say, oh, I need to attend to that um, and focus on that aspect. Um, that's sort of a separate meta layer on top. It's like saying, okay, well, I'm going to attend to things in order and build a structure of the world. Why would I attend to certain subset? Uh, more than others. I could, I could focus on the structure of the ceiling right now as opposed to you in this room. I could, oh, look, we have three, top, four tops up there. Oh, look, that projector. Oh, look, one of the light bulbs is out. Um, you know, I didn't do that. Why? Because this is more relevant right at the moment. But I could have done So a separate question is, you know, if you're going to go learn the structure of the world through movement and through attention, which parts, would, what meta algorithm am I going to use to decide which ones to do? And that's kind of a little extra layer that the basic theory doesn't really care about, the, you know, the structural learning part doesn't care about.
I mean, obviously, I think it's an example of someone, you know, if someone, you know, had a third eye or something like that, you go, oh, yeah, you know, like that. But it would be part of general intelligence, right? Well, the, the general intelligence is learning this framework of the world, uh, learning the structure of the world. So this whole attention in due time is a, a core to it. The salency part is really more of a biological need, maybe. Uh, you know, what, would I tend more to some of the opposite sex, or would I tend more to food sources, or would I tend more to things that look like danger? Um, that's not really part of what general intelligence is. That is just biological functions that are important. So if we're going to build a model the world, my biological body says, these are the things that are more important than other things. Um, but I don't think that's just part of the, the central goal or understanding what a model of the world is. It's just like, oh, how would I put some various uh, um, values on certain things that are more important than others? You, you mentioned a gun, but we have, we have built-in mechanisms to recognize snakes. This, is, this isn't the old brain. This is not, you don't have to learn it. You're born with a fear of snakes. So, you know, okay, that's important for biology. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, is it important for general intelligence? Not really. Um, go back to your example where you said you're following the phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, it's a phone. Let's say you want to find the power valve. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's on one side or the other, right? I mean, are waves going on through the network to see you know, which side's got higher activation potential, or is it something well, more Well, this gets to the building a very model. Uh, so if, you, if, if it's my phone, I know exactly where the buttons are. So if I, um, you know, if I, if I know that the speaker is here, and how this phone is in rela related to my body, I instantly know where to move to get to the volume buttons or to the power button. Um, and that's because I have a model of my phone that's invariant to the, the, the way it's oriented to my body. And you can do it with your left finger, your middle finger, your pinky, your toe. Yeah. Uh, these are all problems we think about. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm serious. And uh, it's because these are, <laughs> these, are, these, are, these are constraints on the solution. The answer the solution is say you have to have this invariant representation of the object and you have to be able to apply different parts of your body to those models. And, um, and how do you do that? You maybe you never touched your power button with your pinky, but you have no trouble doing it. So I'm just mentioning those are the kind of things, these are very difficult constraints on the solution and all of our, our solutions are trying to address those constraints. And it's key to this whole flexibility of general intelligence. Be able to do that. You don't have to train your pinky a million times touching the power button before you can touch it reliably. You if, you had, if you had a new phone and you wouldn't know where the power button is, you just wouldn't know. And what you but you know what power buttons feel like, and you would assume that the, that there is a power button. If the power button on a new phone didn't feel anything like the power buttons on the old phone, good luck. You're never going to do it. But assuming that you that you say, okay, well I don't know what it is, but I can. Um, I will just explore, I mean, my hands in the dark box, I'm going to explore on the phone until I find something that feels like a power button, then I'll press it. Um, you know, so you at least know what you're looking for, because you know what a power button feels like. If you don't know what a power button feels like, then you're not going to find it. Um, but, you know, but as Pacific points out, if you have a good model of your phone, then you know where it is. Uh, you know, I don't know what mine is. Right, so you mentioned, right? So if you have a good model of your phone, it could probably degrade to location based, right? But if you don't, it be composite or well if you don't you're still um it's like saying okay you've never been in this room before but where's the whiteboard right you open it up and you look at the oh my eyes and look this way well i don't know what the whiteboard is but i know what a whiteboard is and so i just start, start attending to things oh that's kind of like but no that's a, that's a projection screen i made that mistake once and i wrote it on projection screen <laughs> 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 oh that's a light oh that's a panel that's a, oh that's a whiteboard so my point is, you, you know, you don't have a knowledge of this room, but you do have knowledge of a whiteboard. You can just go around and start attending to things, and all of a sudden, when you find the whiteboard, now you, you already know you're in the room, and now you know where the whiteboard is in the room. You've done it. You've learned it. You can learn from this position and then refer it from another position. So you really just need one instance of seeing that whiteboard in this room, and you've got it down. Uh, so the theory has to explain that. Um, uh, Mark and I are working on the details of that. What do each of the numbers in a sparse distributed representation correspond to in a biological brain? Is it a, is it a neuron or is it a... Uh, there's different things. So at the most fundamental level, each neuron's activity can be a bit in the SDR. So if a neuron fires or not, that's like a one or a zero. 10,000 neurons, 200 are active. So 200 ones, 9,800 zeros. 
Yeah. But there's other places where SBR show up. So synapses, for example, um, correspond to a very sparse set of connections from another population. So if you have, if a neuron has 10 synapses on its dendrite, it's chosen to connect to 10 specific neurons out of a population. So the set of synapses on the dendrite is also an SDR. Right? So it might be 10 out of a, a thousand possible neurons if you connect it. I, I like to think about it like from a neuron standpoint, if you think about if you're a neuron, you've got all your synapses, you can think about that's your SDR, all those synapses and whatever, what, what's on, that's the signal you're getting and you decide whether you're gonna fire or what you're gonna do, depending on that. That's one way to look at it. The other way is your synapse and lots of other SDRs of other cells that are observing you in some way, you know, on, on the end of their synapse. And so that one bit can, can mean a bunch of different things to a bunch of different cells that are doing the exact same thing that you're doing in, at your level, right? Yeah. What were you doing? That's <laughs> <laughs> period. <laughs> question about your yeah. plan here. So are you trying to just demonstrate that these uh, biologically uh, derived features are going to augment existing techniques and then at some point you're going to say okay we've got some evidence and now we're going to build like HTM you know 3.0 or whatever you're going to call it. Um, or do you think you're just going to keep adding on these features to like I don't know con some some LSTM or something, and eventually it becomes like a completely different algorithm. Yeah, so I think of these principles as being essential for building intelligent systems. Or, um, and you can think of this thing as a set of design principles and a set of design patterns for building intelligent uh, systems. And uh, we, we know how they work in the neuroscience, now we have to figure out how to get best get it working in intelligent uh, systems. So it's not like just trying to demonstrate that this is possible. We think these are actually core properties that you need to have. Uh, it's kind of the, the blueprint for building intelligent systems. Are you asking, uh, are we just going to keep adding things to deep learning networks, or are we going to break off from that? I guess, if so there's no HTM system, uh, implementation right now that combines all this together, right? No. All these principles? No. Um, so well, we have for our paper, we've implemented, yeah. I would say, you know, we've implemented column voting and everything about this, but those, those are in artificial, mostly artificial scenarios uh, to show various problems. Those are little simulations, they're not, yeah. they're not applicable to machine So if you look at HTM research, there's a, um, the repository, there's implementation of column voting that, that we use in there. Uh, there's a long list of kind of very specific things, and I assume the list will actually be even longer. Uh, can you think of any um, ways how these could emerge from some even more fundamental principles uh, so that you wouldn't need to code them in? Mm, I guess you could redo evolution. <laughs> 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 some people are doing that. Uh, so that's you know, it's funny, because it, it, it's actually what Sukhita did here. He made this long list, but conceptually in our brain, or at least in my brain, it's not a long list. It's a very simple, basic idea. And then it's about modeling the world through sensory motor movement using reference frames. And that is like this fundamental principle. And then you can tease apart these individual components. Uh, this is what you have to do to implement the big principle. Um, it's not just a laundry list. So in some sense, we started with the big principle, and now we've kind of made it. It's just more like the, the jurors, you know, the task assignments we have to go through. Um, to do the big idea. So that's our implementation list. It's not a laundry list of ideas. It's all built on a very singular, important, the thousand brain theory can be encapsulated in a couple sentences that explain what the hell's going on here. Um, and then this is our task we have to go through um, to do these things. Um, so it doesn't, it, it may appear to use like some ad hoc list, but that's really not the way it started. It, it, comes from the it comes from the big ideas of neuroscience, or a theory group. We, we just go for these big ideas, and then you say, okay, well, can I implement that big idea? These are the different parts that are going on. So all this stuff corresponds to real things in the neuroscience. Um, everyone needs. And so we can talk what cells they are, what connections they are, what their physiological properties are. Um, and um, so, I don't know, it's, it's, um, it's just what you have to do to get there. Um, I don't think at the moment, I think if I think about your question very quickly here, I don't think there's a shortcut. Uh, I don't think you can, 
that these will disappear. Yeah. And this is one of the surprises to me. You know, neural networks are pretty damn simple. They're really simple things. And there's something attractive about that. But the brain is really complex and messy. You look at you know a cortical column, 100,000 neurons. Those are those are 100,000 neurons are divided into maybe two or three dozen different types, and and they're, they have all these different properties. And it's like this is not a simple thing. And what what maybe what's been really the most surprising for me in the last few years is to realize how complex a function it actually implements. But we're very confident in it now. So it's like oh, when, and then we think about it a bit, and other people thought about it. We now realize other people realized this a long time ago too. We were just talking about some papers from Jeff Hinton this morning that the Marcus was reviewing that he wrote in 1981, and he talked about almost not, well, he talked about a bunch of these things: these composite yeah. objects, the locations, transforms. He didn't talk about grid cells. He didn't talk about neurons. But he went through this very complex thing, saying in 1981, this is what has to be happening. So um, you know. That's what it is. <laughs> There's no shortcuts, unfortunately. Uh, but at least once you get this done, you just make lots of copies of it. And then you're, you know, the feature of hardware implementation of the brain is that you're going to have something like a quarter column, which is a pretty complex thing, but it's not that big. And uh, and then you just make thousands of copies. Yeah, it seems very attractive. You don't need to understand the whole brain. You just need to understand 50,000 neurons. So. Yeah. Well, it works, so. yeah. You just went from 100 to 50,000. That's, that's better. We're making progress already. I said 100. You said. <laughs> It is probably more like 50,000. Question. Yes. Uh, where does the data from the hippocampus come in? The, the data, data from the hippocampus. So uh, I think if you talk about connections to the neocortex, uh, it's. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Because yeah. don't you need to get information from the hippocampus to make decisions? Uh, uh. The hippocampus <laughs> connects to a small subset of the neocortex. Yeah. You just kind of what people traditionally think of at the top of the cortical hierarchy, it sort of connects uh, to that piece of it. And it's not necessarily a response to I'm, necessary for V1. I'm that. guessing you didn't read yeah. the January framework paper yet. No. Okay. <laughs> um, really, really briefly, the hippocampus is a very old system. It evolved a long time ago. And what it allows an animal to do is know where it is in the world, know what it did, it has episodic memories, uh, navigation in spaces. It, it's like a complete little memory world of the, of the animal's life. And that thing is under a lot of evolutionary pressure for many, many long time, so it's very detailed in how it builds a model of the spaces that you walk through in your episodic memory. The basic theory we outlined, and we described this in the January framework paper, is that the mechanisms that the hippocampus used to map out rooms and spaces have now been copied and made many, many copies of it in the neocortex. And the neocortex is applying the same basic principle to every tip of your finger, every part of your skin, every part of your retina. So every part of your body is like a little animal moving around in the world. Every part of your sensory arrays is like, it's like a rat. The hippocampus, when you, they, they, took, they, they measure it, they put rats in rooms and they watch what happens to the hippocampus as the rat moves around the room. And what's going on here is like every part of your sensory arrays, every part of your skin, every part of your eyes is like a little rat exploring the world. That's the, the basic analogy. And so the hippocampus is not fundamentally different than the neocortex. It's just an older system that was evolved under a certain set of principles, and the neocortex abstracted it and made a cleaner version that can be applied to everything. And so they're really not fundamentally at odds with each other. And so as Supertype pointed out, people talk about the hippocampus as being sort of like one more region of the neocortex, even though it's structured differently. It's sort of like a continuum. And so it, to understand how the neocortex relates to the rest of the, neo, uh, how the hippocampus relates to the next of the neocortex is not too much different than asking how does the visual region re relate to um, a, an auditory region. It's, it's sort of like a, an old version of, you know, it's like the old, imagine you have a fleet of modern cars, you know, all electric Teslas or whatever, and then you got this 1934, you know, uh, you know or something or other, yeah. And, and so that's the hippocampus, but it's kind of a car. And they, they still use gas, and they can talk to each other, and they can use the same road. Um, uh, it's kind of like that. So it's really, it's not like this is the hippocampus which is transferring information to the, to the neocortex. They're going both ways, and um, they're both doing the same basic thing. Um, it just turns out that there's far more experimental data on the hippocampus. Uh, far more. And so uh, people talk about it as this thing we know about. Um, and uh, we're trying to say, hey, you know what? The neocortex really isn't any different. It's the same thing. It's just a cleaned up, modern, spiffy version of it. Um, 
So this idea that you're transferring information is, is no different than transferring information elsewhere. It's really more, it's more I would, if I were just to guess right now, it's more like column voting than it is like transfer of information. It's a good question. But. Yeah, one question. Um, the thing that got me thinking, this, the newer stuff that you guys are doing, which is like so powerful, you need, it seems like intuitively, you need more complex use cases to show that power. So you've like mm -hmm. comes in with the, uh, with the cups, uh, or you recognize that it's a cup, recognizing yeah. these objects, and you have a bank of objects, and you've shown that, I think that's awesome. I feel like, because you talked about maybe like jumping back in into the applied neuroscience and really kind of like, you know, coming out there, and I wonder if there's been like a, a thought effort from here or within the, I don't know, just with anybody of like, trying to come up with a really awesome, like attention getting application, like what if like, you could take principles, but maybe instead of like yeah. identifying objects, like, I don't know, like, I don't know, like, if, like, if you had some, like, somehow, like, a, a drone that could recognize where it's at. And what would be a killer it? demo? Yeah. Right? <laughs> What's a killer demo of these principles? Uh, is that one way of phrasing it? Yeah, exactly. That's the way we they would it. really make you feel, it's like, like, I feel like, like, people feel it's like, like, artificial intelligence is, like, doing, th like, I think of it as, like, when a machine starts to do things that you couldn't believe a machine yeah, could yeah, do yeah, on yeah, its yeah, own. Yeah, yeah. So, like, you're doing that with a, with a recognized we've, object, we've asked this you know, question here. Yeah. Uh, it's not an everyday question for us. Every right. once in a while, we sit back and say, "How are we going to demonstrate this? How are we going to demonstrate in a way that people sit and go, oh shit!'" Yeah, or the you know. Says, "Hey, we're building up." What's our current thinking about that? <laughs> 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 well, you don't have that money, right? <laughs> yeah. There's a yeah, suggestion box going on. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I'll put like, but I just think something where like you would, um, I think necessary for it though is because you're talking about like attention and and uh, which I think comes back to to values, like things like and values are imposed on us because we. Have to stay alive, yeah. so we have to care about certain things. I'm just like, oh, I recognize that pattern of a tiger. It's like I'm gonna die, mm -hmm. right? So I have to care about things. So if you're, let's say, a recon drone or something like that, you know that you want to get the most information, and you know you don't want to get destroyed. Let's say, so you have like those basic values. Right. I'm just thinking, like, if you could use the recognition of things, or I could recognize, like, I want to be best. So, 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 you know, you got, you got, the, you got like, like off go, go, or you know, you have these, you know, you have, you know, you have, you know, um, you know self driving cars and so on. Mm -hmm. The problem we have is if you pick a particular task like that, mm -hmm. um, almost, it's almost always a dedicated solution that does that particular mm -hmm. task very well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't think any intelligent machine is going to be alpha go. I just don't think so. You want to talk about it? And so, you know, it's like, <laughs> but that's all it does. So I think we've, we've asked ourselves a lot of times, like, what will be the children uh, done on this? And uh, I didn't have a long conversation with Larry Page about this, because he's like, oh, I need, like, the, you guys need to come up with, like, you know, a moonshot. And um, it's very hard to come up with that. So what we, we haven't given up on it. But, but what the approach we're taking right now is to say, okay, let's take a little more subversive approach. Let's just say, you guys are already doing, you know, image recognition. You're already doing this. We're just going to do a better job of it. You know, that's, that gets people's attention, too. Yeah. Yeah. And also, yeah, and they'll say, like, okay, well, you didn't solve a new problem, but you did a better job of the old problem. And even that, I like, should tell you, we don't think we can do better accuracy, but we can do better other things. We can do better power, we can do better learning, less learning, we can do more robustness, we can solve a bunch of other problems that people are starting to recognize as a serious problem. And generalization. Like that was the thing about like just like in the in one of your slides about new pick it's like from some time ago, it's like this domain, this domain, this yeah. domain, no mm -hmm. hyperparameters. Yeah. 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 yeah, if you had like movements through space of different sorts. Yeah. Even if it was like in some other kind of space, like because I know it's uh, I don't know if it's a good way of handling a kind of kind of this like handling uh, image input and, and vision, uh, like like uh, image input to the system right now without doing mm -hmm. some kind of deep learning nozzle to convert into SDR or something like that. But if it was just like a like an intelligently blind thing that could move, like you know, just something. I like, totally agree. Yeah. We don't we don't have a lot of uh, DNA here in that to, that's good at that kind of uh, demoid thinking, you know. Um, I've never been good at it, um, you know. Uh, I don't like to think about people, but I don't think we really have a lot of detail. Some people are just really good at coming up with just, you know, killer ideas, even if they're good or not. Um, so um, maybe we're just too nervous or something. I don't know. Um, uh, so, but we're open to that. We can think of one. Um, and I think it's really, we can ask us to think about that quite a bit. Just 
Jane Comps Club. Right, she's the marketing. Right? Yeah, <laughs> she's not even a marketing person. She's a business person. So, yeah. but, but she knows the value of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we haven't succeeded yeah. in that yet. So part of the trick is it's not one path. Part yeah. of the definition of intelligence is that you can learn new things on the fly. Yeah. yeah. And so you have to kind of. I think you know, so he's that makes sense that he's showing the answer. answer. The answer is you could do you could solve three problems that you know, and we were four problems using you know the same untuned system or something like that. Because he's very different, different like reinforcement learning objective functions mm -hmm. essentially. But you have yeah, to have you know, some kind of right. right. So, so without well, defining an objective function up front. One of the limitations of deep learning is, I guess, like. You can only build about maybe 150 layers, and then your like you get diminishing returns because your gradients don't propagate through the network. Can you solve that problem? Can you build like 10,000 uh, layer higher? Actually, don't. Oh, no, no, no. We could solve it the other way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the brain doesn't have 150 layers either. It has maybe I don't know, 10 to 14 total. Layers. Yeah. levels. Yeah. Of the network. And if we're currently yeah. believing that you know yeah. serious yeah. vision occurs in, in in less than four. Yeah. Um, so it's not about how many layers you can add, it's about the, the complexity and the power of each layer, uh, or uh, each region, a cortical column, or each, each region. Uh, this is what Jeff was trying to do with this capsule thing, thing we were just talking about this morning. Um, and he, you know, he, he recognized that this is a shortcoming, and he proposed sort of a, a very similar idea to what we have here, but without, this is without uh, really the motion component, uh, no constant movement. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we want, want to go the other way. way. In fact, I think, I, you know, I, I wrote this, uh, I think it was in Franklin's paper, but you know, a mouse, you know, reasonable vision, not as good as human, but you can see things pretty well, um, um, really only has one level in its visual hierarchy. Uh, it's got one big D1, and B2 and G, and B4 and B2 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 but you look at the mouse and brain, B1 is relatively large, and there's hardly any other visual system. So that mouse does vision in one level. Um, our theory is so, so how. Uh, so we really want to get to that other direction. We want to look on that and say, you know, um, doesn't require a lot of levels. It requires adding location and, and composition um, to the single level. And um, that's, that's the key. I mean, I think these high level D1 networks have no concept of invariant representation, really, do they? Not much, you know. It's all you have to train specifically. To be at the same angle, right? Like I could write an energy from here, but then I'm not sitting there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's one of the examples I use all the time in our recent meetings. Like, what if I walk into this room and I sat down here and I open my eyes and never seen this room before? I look around and I say, okay. Now, tomorrow, you drop in your seat. I open my eyes. Not, I look around. I'll immediately recognize I'm in the same room. I'll know where I am in that same room. I don't have to do any additional learning. That's the problem. That, that's a wonderful thing to do. And uh, we have to be we think we understand basically how that's done, all the details are still sort of in some details. Um, but that's, that's a powerful learning mechanism, you know. The quality, not the quantity. Yeah. The unfortunate, unfortunate thing is, you know, probably humans, that we, we, there's a no free lunch theory that Sutta always reminds us about. So you come up with a general purpose learning system that can learn phones and coffee cups and beers and computers and so on. It's not going to be the best at any one of those things. And um, so that's, we've got to get out of our minds that we're going to beat people that, you know, go or beat people that, you know, driving cars. And not, you know, anybody's going to, or Tesla or someone's going to build better driving cars than any general intelligent human would be. Um, so it's really got to go to that general properties. Yeah. You know, we're going to focus on that. It's like why they wanted the computer, like I said, and it's like the, the digital computer. It wasn't necessarily. It's it's, yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. in the book, probably. So I don't yeah. think I told you what's going on. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's, uh, exactly. It's exactly. It's kind of you know, a dedicated solution is almost always better. You could always use less power, and uh, definitely use less power, and um, and uh, in having a dedicated solution to a problem. If you have that dedicated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we have a trade off in the world to build general purpose computers, which are, you know, are more powerful, they take more power and are less efficient in some other ways, but at least uh, they're general purpose. And so, um, and occasionally we'll say, oh, no, it's important to build a dedicated chip to dedicated to solve this particular problem. So, same thing here. We gotta focus on that generalization somehow. Yeah. In psychology, people often talk about a left brain and a right brain. I'm wondering how is that compatible with the idea of 
uh, a uniform array of cortical columns. I can do it. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, okay, you got a uniform array of cortical columns, they all vote, right? We said maybe there's 150,000 in your brain. What if I cut in half and now I have 75,000 on one side, 75,000 on the other side? They're still brains, they still vote. It's just now you have two small brains. Um, the beauty is that that's the, the whole process of having left brain and right brain comes out of having the fact that there's a the repetition of the structure. You can add more or less and it still works. And so you can write your brain to four parts and they're all think to some extent. Um, so that, that's, that comes out of the fact that it's built out of repetitive units because the number of units and exactly which ones you have doesn't really matter. As long as you got enough of them, they get enough sensory input, it's going to work. But I'm thinking of like people who say the left brain is more logical and the right yeah, The only real thing you know for certain is that uh, your left brain is, uh, has the, it, the, the one really true unique differentiation between left and right brain is that language occurs on one side only in most people. Um, and there's some theories why that is. Uh, it's really, and so, um, you know, the other stuff is a bit fuzzy. So there are differences between the left brain and the right brain. I can talk about them one of those. There are, um, the, and there are theories why that's the case, but the general theory is none of the same. So if, when you have a split brain, uh, people have the split brain thing, where you cut the corpus callosum and, and they, they, they do that to prevent epilepsy, then they have two brains going on. They, they you know, they do different things. They're one hand trying to do one thing, the other hand trying to do the other thing. If they are made of the same stuff, why would one do language and Okay, so that's a specific question, which is like, why is this one asymmetry? And um, no one knows, but the best hypothesis that I've heard is that language is a very high speed thing. It requires processing in the, in the order of just a few milliseconds and the differences between things, and that's very much, very different than everything else you do with it. And so to get language to work, you have to have highly myelinated neurons, meaning they have to be highly insulated, and the amplitude makes them work faster. Myelination takes space and energy. And you don't want to highly myelinate everything. It's like, why put all the high, you know, I don't need high speed buses everywhere in the brain. I only need it for language. And it's very expensive from a metabolic point of view. So it, it appears that the language areas in the left neocortex, right around here, are, they are, they are designed for high speed processing. That's one theory, I don't know if it's right. That's one theory, but it's, it's a kind of reason why you might have that. It's too expensive to put it on most sides. Um, so why about it, you know? And of course, humans have language beyond that. It's one of our unique features. So, yeah, you know, that may be why other animals don't have language, because we evolved that one extra tweak that broke the symmetry for some reason, you know? It sounds like you don't think it's too important for the left right brain thing for your theory. No, I think so at all. Yeah, totally not. Um, you know, it's just a convenient place. To, it turns out that the physical cortex is divided into two sheets and there's a big bundle of nerve fibers going between them. And so it's easy for people to experiment by cutting that. Um, but you know, you can, you can have a trauma to one other part, in some part of your brain, and the rest of your part of the brain works just fine. You know, you become blind, but damn here you still hear and touch it, you know. And you still have a model of the world. It's, it's just like you're getting Right. Yeah, thinking about um, goals, and, um, do you have in your research like agenda plans to study like how you, know, you would come up with like a conceptual model of, of, of a way to add um, biases or preferences? You know, Jeff was talking earlier about you know nature as you know, evolution has built in some preferences in humans, and so if you wanted say a robot to pick up trash off the street, well, you'd, you'd have to build in its uh, into it a preference to, to you know, pick up that trash and have it in the trash can as opposed to laying around. So I, I disagree. Uh, I mean, it feels that way. If, if you didn't do that, it seems like you, you say build it in, build it in. Okay, I can ask you to pick up trash on the street. And you'll do it. You know, I would do it. And uh, and uh, you know, and so fine. Do you have a built-in desire to pick up trash? No, but if you're given that task, you're going to do it. Now, uh, my teenager does not. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one thing to say I have a tell machine and I give it some task or a temporary goal to pursue. There's a lot of them that's just built in thing. Like we have a desire to defend ourselves, to live, to procreate, sex, things like that. Um, uh, but that's not the same as most of the things we do every day. 
Right? We have no built-in desire to, from evolution to study brains or, or you know, create open source projects or whatever. To learn, learn. Right? Well, well, there is a thing about learning, yes. So in general, we like to learn. Uh, but it could be anything. Learning is fun, it's true. Yeah. So I think we have to, you can really separate the way I, the way I describe this in the, in the book is you, you think of the neocortex as like a map, right? That's the common analogy that neuroscientists use. It's like a map of the world, it's like a model of the world. Think about a map. And I can have a map of the world, and uh, the map itself is valueless. Imagine it's a map that tells me how to see about the world. I could use it for good things, I could use it for bad things. I could use it to plunder and kill people, I could use it to trade. Uh, the map itself is not full of value and full of um, intent or emotions or desires and goals. It's just like it's a representation of the structure of the world. That's what your neocortex is. It, on its own, it does not have these values. It's the old part of your brain, which is like similar to every other animal, that has those values. And, uh, and it just uses the neocortex like a map. It says, okay, I want to, you know, hoard all this, you know, Bitcoin, I'm going to you know, steal it from somebody, I'm going to use my neocortex to figure out the best way of going to do that. And the neocortex says, sure, you want to do anything? Just, I'll tell you how to do it. You know, it's, it's, I'm just a map of the world, I'm just a, a model of the world. Um, but Does it work the other way sometimes, though? Like you said, um, we're born in fear of snakes. But yeah, that's the old brain. If you work in a snake enclosure, get used to it. Not scared of them. Yeah, I don't know how that works. So, <laughs> 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 yeah. well, we feel like experience can kind of work back the other way. You know, my wife has fear of heights, and we do a lot of hiking. Uh, and we've been doing this now together for four years, um, more than that. And uh, she still has fear of heights. I mean, she hasn't gotten over that. I don't know if you ever go the snake thing, but I mean, all I'm saying is the fear of snakes is built into the old brain, and the old brain is flexible too. I mean, it's not without learning. The way I think it's like the old brain, like a crocodile brain, something like that, and crocodile learns things. Um, so, I don't know. We don't study the old brain. So, we're really just focused on what that model is, the neocortex. And there's a lot, it's, in some sense, it's, even though it's bigger, it's simpler in the sense that it's a repetitive algorithm, and the old brain's got all these pieces all over the place that are hobbled together over time. So what I hear you saying, Jeff, maybe is that you're not really particularly interested in, in studying how to interface a goal or an agenda into this system. I think you can ask the neocortex, how should I accomplish something? I'm interested in that. Um, it's like not learning to value things. What's that? Like there's things that you automatically value. We do as humans. Hold you value, but then things you like, like like picking up trash. It's like I have a value that I want to help make a cleaner environment. I wasn't born with that. I wasn't necessarily instructed. Well, maybe that's your value. Or maybe someone says, I'll pay you to do it. Or maybe someone says, you know, do me a favor. Uh, right. uh, I don't know. I mean. Yeah. Or you could, for whatever reason, you see a documentary or two, and you're like, oh, I care about this. Like, you come to care about it. Yeah, okay. You learn to care. Yeah. Right? But I don't think the neocortex learns. It's not the neocortex. It, I think that's the point here. Right? It, it, yeah. So it's interfacing with this caring system yeah. in terms of it's predicting about the value. Yeah, so, it's and, doing so it. when you want to build a tell machine, you have the, the central ingredient is this, this model of the world, this map of the world that can be used for achieving goals and figuring things out. And then you have to pair it with some embodiment and some set of goals. Yeah, cool. uh, and those goals can be as simple as I want to learn. Those goals can be I just want to do what you asked me to do. It could be very straightforward. It might not really have any sort of emotional content to it. It just says, okay, you know, do this, I'll be able to do that. <laughs> you know? um, but, you know, ultimately someone has to do it. I mean, someone has to decide what to do. I, I think that when we think about intelligent machines, the, the point is that intelligent machines are going to sit around one day and say, okay, you know, what am I going to do right now? I'm tired of picking up garbage. You know, you know, <laughs> I want more in life. You know, I'm satisfied. I'm tiredness. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, someone might try to build that, but we're not trying to build that. We're just trying to say, how would I, how would I add this ability to the model and do anything? But if you wanted to give it goals that were more general, like something, I guess that's maybe what I thought of like the recon thing, is it's like gather information from yeah. what's going on, but you have to figure out how to effectively do that given a thought about that. It's something where like, in terms of like rubber hitting the road, like putting an application out there, people are like, wow, that is AI. Right, it's the kind of feeling that you, it's like, I don't know, just from a layman perspective in terms of like what separates AI for me from like really smart statistics. You know, it's like mm -hmm. doing, yeah. being able to have these kind of uh, issue sure, with it. I'm not sure if it's having the goals or if it's more like being flexible to achieve various 
various various goals that you would give it. To. Right, right. As, a, as long as it gets it from somewhere. Right? Yeah, so, so I don't need it to be yeah. built into the system. Yeah. You, yeah. We can sit down and say, you're, we want you to learn to play chess, and we want you to learn to drive a car, and we want you to learn to, you know, I don't know, my Bitcoins, I don't know what it is, but go for it, you know? <laughs> I, I don't know, I mean, we're, we're not that, I was talking earlier about, you know, we're, we're not even thinking about these very specific tasks. Mm -hmm. It's really about, the, the whole system is about the fundamental mo idea of model building mm -hmm. and, and how that is done. Mm -hmm. And that then is the foundation for the future. And it's the same way the people in the 1940s were, were figuring out what is the nature of algorithms, what is the, are algorithms completable or not? They weren't sitting around going, how are we going to build a GPS system? And, right, you know, yeah, like, you yeah. know, like, right, right. Uh, we're at that level. Um, yeah. We're not. Yeah. We're, well, they couldn't probably conceive of a GPS. I know. And so I don't think we can conceive of the real operations right. either. Right. Right. So I, I guess I'm just saying we're, we're not even, you know, they didn't ask themselves, how am I going to do a pipeline architecture? They were saying, right. what is the nature of computation? Yeah. What is the fundamental yeah. aspects of a Turing yeah. machine or a yeah. universal? I think we're at that level here, and that's yeah. where our focus is. It should be. I agree. Um, I just, to get more people to pay attention. Okay. Some but you come, come and do a great demo. You know? uh, yeah, we're, 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 uh, I was hoping you'd tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you brought up the word. I, yeah. no, I thought that was a standard term. So is consciousness, so is, you know. Yeah. You, you, well, you know, so is. Well, when people are talking about how they prevent an AI from, you know, killing humans and stuff, they're, they're that, maybe this is too early in your research, but it, it seems like there needs to be some way to make this thing so it, it doesn't, uh, you know, start to... No, it's the other way around. I just finished writing this chapter. Well, where's so, the it's, it's, like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the other way around. You have to go really out of your way to get it to do that. It's not going to do it on its own. It's just not going to happen one day and say, I'm going to kill everybody. It just, it's, you know, computers don't do that. It's not going to do that either. You have to really go out of your way to build a system that was sinister or hated humans. Um, it's just not going to happen. A model of the world does not do bad things. A map isn't bad. But maybe an evil human could be augmented with it. Yeah, an evil, <laughs> evil human could be augmented with a map. Yeah, or evil anything. But it's hard to actually make things evil. So, but don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you give a system broad goals without specific constraints, like, here's my portfolio, like, grow it. Like all right, I'll invest in defense stocks, start a war, you know, and then the price of this will go up. You know what I mean? Like if you get could do that, yeah, yeah. You could if it was smart and it didn't care about anything except your goal. You know yeah. I mean? But it, but it's sitting there and be like, I'm a computer. I don't like humans. I'm gonna find a way to kill them. Like that, I think is mm -hmm. further into. You know, uh, here, here's a good example. There are bad scenarios. Yeah, uh, Asimov. It's no so different than humans. I mean, humans do that too. Asimov had his three laws of robotics, right? And one of them, you know, they were like, don't do harm and don't harm a human or something like that. So think about a self-driving car, right? Uh, we build in some basic self-driving you know, things in a self-driving car. So I, I don't drive a Tesla, but I have a car that has a. Um, you know, adaptive cruise control and, and, uh, and so on. And if it detects a human, it'll put the brakes on. Yeah. Right now, that's built into the system. Right. That's Asimov's second law. Right. You know, yeah. don't harm a human. And so you got to do some basic things right. like that. Uh, if you do, if you built a car that didn't stop when it saw a human, that would be right. pretty bad design. Right. So, so it doesn't care internally. It doesn't have to care. It just to build some you know. basic safeguards. Uh, that's where I think it. we start there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Bad. Prevent bad accidents. Yeah. Probably. We we can decide. Part. We can say, hey, car, we're going to die. We're going to design the people detector, and when the people detector detects people, we're going to apply the brakes. We're going to completely ignore everything else that you're telling you to do. So my car will ignore my commands with the with the accelerator if it sees the person. You know, just going. I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what you tell me to do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's some basic things to do, I think. It's, it's not like this sort of run amok, out of control computer you know, machine deciding to do all these things on their own. Regarding general intelligence, I guess I came into, into this room thinking that general intelligence was more something like human. 
intelligence, but it sounds like you're saying, no, it's much more limited. It's like a learning algorithm using these methods. I wouldn't say it's limited. I would say it's actually less limited than being a human. Um, it's a general purpose way of learning the structure of the world. Yeah. So and, it, and, and it could be a, it could learn structure that you and I can't learn. Right. Okay. So so then my question is, if you implement all this, are you at your goal, or is there more? This is the base. I don't think there are any other big ideas. Uh, there's no other big thing that we're missing here, um, as far as I can tell. So this, if you can get imp implement that the way you know, there's pieces. Be, there, there are pieces we know that are missing in this. But the framework that the, the January paper says a framework for intelligence, right? It's a fr that framework we understand. So that's the the goal. That's the general intelligence. That's it. You, you, you do all the stuff we know about, which is in this list, and, and there's many details that are not in this list. But this is the big ideas here. Then, I, as far as I can tell, that's it. But that's not solved into a consciousness, right? No, has, no, no nothing Pretty much. Yeah, it's, it's, I, well, we can have a whole separate conversation on consciousness. Let's, let's, let's not do that today. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just today, before you guys go out, I was reading this a new book by uh, Annika uh, Harris, this Sam Harris's wife, and it's a book about consciousness. Fortunately, it's very short. Uh, I almost got through it this afternoon. Um, but it's an interesting topic, but we don't talk about that here. Um, I have some very definite opinions about consciousness, but um, I actually think a system like this would be conscious, but I don't need to make that argument. Uh, consciousness is very much related to continuous learning and having a continuous memory of things you just have thought about and things you just have done. Constantly updating the memory of even your thoughts. Um, and so this, this system could exhibit those principles. That's not the longest thread on the board, isn't it, that one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I haven't read that one. That one is the one about determinism. You, 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 uh, you keep me away from that one. You'll never finish the book. Uh, <laughs> I just yeah. do one of the kinds of times that I'm so. Yeah, I, we, we, need, we should like probably wrap up. I got the whole thing. Yeah. Pretty so, robust use case to show that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. One, one quick thing, and then I'm going to let you guys go. There's a lot of humanness to that. Uh, I so it's like, maybe it's intelligent if I like, get scared and do something, or if I like, want something. It's uh, hard to intelligence, but if I like, don't want anything. Sam Fader, too. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, w I want to get through this, and you guys can chat. I'll yeah. stick around for you guys to chat. Two, so, two things I'm going to work on, I'm working on this year, and I'm going to let you go. For the people that are watching on Trip, Twitch, you guys are already like fished in, so I got you. <laughs> but every, I'm doing a bunch of stuff on Twitch, and it's uh, R H Y O L I G H T underscore, which is awful, I know. <laughs> but um, I'm doing two things live research meetings, at least once a week, usually two times a week. And that's just in this room or in my office in, in Watsonville. We're in this room. The research yeah, there, there are research meetings always in this room. Sometimes I'm on the double. And so I'm live streaming research meetings. And, I, and that's been interesting. We've got some good interactions. Join the forum if you're interested in all this, because that's where all of the conversation happens. That's where I put all of this media that, I, that I'm creating. It all gets on the forum. Um, if you want to keep up with what we're doing, join the forum. And the other thing is I'm building an interactive document I'm calling Building HTM Systems, BHTMS. Um, and that actually has a web address, Building HTM dot Systems. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, so that's, that's where it's going to go. It's not done yet. It's halfway there. And, and I'm doing this live on Twitch for the rest of the year until it's done. And I'm going to create a spatial cooler. We're going to create a temporal memory algorithm. We're going to put it all together with live visualization so you can see it all running. So that's my plans for the year. And if you want to keep up with me, uh, subscribe on Twitch with your kids. Uh, ask your kids how to do it. That's a great job. He's very responsible. Responsive. Responsive. I don't think he's responsible. You're very responsive. Does a great job. Great ideas. Great ideas. Great ideas. Great ideas. Great ideas. Great ideas. The whole team comes up with new people all the time. So he's a tremendous resource. And don't hesitate to reach out to him if you have any questions about it. So I hope some of you guys need to leave. I'm going to stick around uh, for a little while. I'm going to leave the live stream on while people are still filtering it out. Uh, but thanks, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate you being part of our team. That's great. Yeah. It's great to get some new questions. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks, Abdi. Yeah. Yeah. This concludes our events for the evening. <laughs> So if you were to start something today, you're saying New Pick is probably not where you go. No, it's, uh, New Pick was uh, now a point in time. Um, 
It's not like talking about it. Because if you could be starting with a code base that was purely oh, derived from uh, the so that was, And now we just started with a code base and just started taking things to the DJ and that was. And that was how we decided to do it. So, that was the main topic of the year. Okay, we're starting with the classic.
they all have a relationship to the input space. We're only going to take those that are the most, that have the most overlap under their representation with the input space. And those are the ones that are going to be the winners in this layer. So instead of doing the ray loop, which is a really simple activation, the gateway is the same thing. It's a nonlinear activation that uh, introduces nonlinearity just like the ray loop. You go home tonight? Yeah. That's a long drive. Be careful, okay? I will. I'll be okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. You're a mate. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I will think so. I'm going to take off. Okay, take care. Yeah. No problem. I'll see you later. I'm not really understanding this. So this is all about spatial pooling. So this is sort of spatial pooling. Say you've got an array of inputs. This, this could be any, any type of input, feature vector or whatever. In, in, in uh, HCM, we might call this an input space that is full of SDRs, so some of them are on, some of them are off. But you could also consider it like a bunch of scalar values or, or like a feature vector or something like that. Um, so, the, uh, say we have a bunch of cells that uh, we cut up into the mini models, and each one of these has, has cells in it. You know, this is like the HCM idea of spatial pooling. Each one of these main columns has a specific relationship with this whole input space. Right? And each one of these main columns has a different, um, what we call uh, perceptive field or potential pools. It can only connect to some of these, and they all have like a, a different potential pool of connections that could make. The K is idea. Is all different or there's lots of overlap. Yeah, there's lots of overlap. So you'll have redundancy throughout. Um, so um, as these turn on, um, these guys will turn, some of them will activate if their connections that they have in this space are happen to be overlapping with the activations in, the, in that space. Yeah, that's, that's basically we're simulating proximal dendritic connections from this space to these cells that, that have this similar pool of, of potential connections. So is the K the number of bits that have to be turned on to fire this? Not quite. Okay, I'll get there in a minute. You've got to go, go one more step. So you imagine all of these ping columns doing this at the same time. The, the input activates uh, lights up. I'm, I just did this on Twitch like two days ago. If you want to follow me, I'm, I'm doing visualizations of this right now. Um, so if, as this lights up with an input pattern, um, you know that some of these are going to be selected, a certain number of them, K. That's the K part. A certain number of these spin columns are going to come active based upon that. And it's always the same. We keep it the same. That's how it introduces sparsity. It takes, no matter how many bits are on in here, the same amount of mini columns are going to be active right here. That's one of the things that Facebook Board does. Um, so to decide uh, how, which ones of these are going to become active, it, we call this a competition. They compete. So we, um, the ones that are active, they all have a certain amount of overlap or theta with uh, their receptive field and the actual input. So each one of these has a count, basically how well they match the input. Let's just say one, some of them might have 44, 44 of their, their connections are on, another one is 43, another one is 42, blah, 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 and then you just stack rank them like that, right? So at some point you draw a line, you decide how many of the cells do you want to be on in this population, how many of those do you that's your sparsity. So we typically say 2% of these, and we draw the line right there. That's K. Whatever the, the number that we decided that basically equals 2% is K. So we're going to take the top K, and they're the winners of this competition to represent the information that it is. So the sparse Yep, these are just no, no, there are weights. The, the weights are in these these connections. So these are all weights. No, so the weights, we never sum the weights, we never calculate with the weights. The weights are the memory. The weights are where memory is retained about the bits. Um, and they only use the weights to decide whether the bits active or not, whether this is responding to it or not, whether there's synapse that's been created or not. There's a threshold there. These weights all represent a synapse. You think about synapse 
like this. There's a potential stamp, but they, they grow closer, they grow closer, as you learn, they grow closer, they grow closer. At some point, we say this synapse is connected. Information flows through there. So all these weights are representing how close the connections are. And so at any point, you can look at the ways to calculate, oh, okay, this connection is, is, is open, this connection we're going to ignore, this connection we're going to ignore because the permanence is going to be low. But you don't see it like a partly open or partly closed connection is either closed by or open. Binary, binary, right? Okay. The weights decide whether it's going to be um, even observed or not, whether that bit, that on or off will be observed or not. On your word, so you'll have some of these columns that start to grow in affinity towards certain cells, right? Because the, uh, that's, that's just the way they work. They'll, they'll, they'll all start to sort of focus in on different areas of the spatial patterns of the input, and some will get better at detecting certain things. That's they're doing little feature extractions. And you can't tell, you can't look at this and see this activation and be like, oh, that represents feature X or feature Y. It's like a jumble of features, you know? Like they're all sort of, the, the features are distributed amongst the whole population. So, it's hard to visualize what's actually being represented in there. And you see these mini columns active, you don't know exactly why they're, they're activated because, and you don't know because that's the whole simple memory aspect that I haven't talked about yet either. So just to be sure I follow you, you said the weight is compared to a threshold, and if you're above the threshold, so you care about what's in the cell, and if you're not, then you don't care. We, we call it a permanent threshold. We call that a permanent threshold, um, basically, and we'll, you know, we, we just say, okay, it's 0.5 or point whatever, and we'll use that across the board for all of these. So, if any of them are over 0.5, we'll call it a bank. Well, it seems like there's a normal bank population. I mean, does that mean work with this kind of thing? No, not at all. It's not, it's not it's has nothing to do with background. Bad irrigation is uh, biologically. Um, Seems to be really hard, would be really hard to see like wow. This is about local you know, this is a, you have to think about this being a local area of your field of view, right? Ah, so that's that's a part of uh, that's the learning part of the spatial pooling operation. So once once you get uh, your your set of spatial pool uh, set back in columns. And you take these active columns and you reinforce them by increasing the permanence of those ones that, that were that won the competition. So only the winner columns get their permanence increased. Um, and then the other ones, well, we, have, we have a lot of ways we can twiddle this, you know. We can increase them a lot, we can increase them a little bit. There's a lot of parameters you can do. You can decide to decrease these or just leave them alone. You know, there's a lot of things you can do. But, that, but the learning happens as soon as you identify the winners, then you can reinforce those winners by increasing the permanence. Just two bits that cause the act.
you have to be able to destroy and grow new stamps. And with hardware, that's hard because silicon doesn't grow and degrade. Uh, so how much arithmetic precision do you think you need in those weights? Oh, not a lot. Like how many bits work? I don't know. 32 should be fine. 16 should be fine, honestly. I don't think it's... Is that maybe over? You just need to be able to track something down a little bit, a little bit from 0 to 1. Um, yeah, the, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to be that detailed. All our permanents are still going to be 0 to 1, so, and, so you know, the low, this is, this, this is the same and, and one of the beautiful things about this theory, I think, is that when you're wrong about something, and you choose something that's a little bit different, you typically choose something very similar to what is right. So when, you, when you're incorrect about a prediction, you tend to generalize about something that's almost right.
become evil. Yeah. So I uh, get the intelligence that using the technology ah. will become the kind of stupid action. Oh, then yeah. people can be yeah, evil. Yeah. Such yeah. magical, but uh, yeah. 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 Just as a, a, a PR thing, I, I don't think it would be a good PR to say we're not worried about this and maybe we don't care it's ever going to be a problem. Or, I mean, it just, people will freak out. Well, not that it will never be a problem, but, there's, but I, don't, I think any effort that we put into regulating AI software at the moment is this that regulation is talking about is you're going to make something that you hope will be an artificial general intelligence, yeah. you want to at least like, think, give some thought to how do we make sure it's not going to do something really bad. I, I, we definitely want to do that, but I don't see any place in our research to do that yet. There's no danger that I can see of anything like that happening. Yeah. Um, five, ten years maybe? I mean, it's something that I would definitely keep on the piece of the eye out for, but it's like we're not any place where I would let anything have any autonomy to go make any decisions. You know, we're, we're just working on sequence prediction and, and mapping objects right now. You know? The example we know that just sit in there and being my fault was very good. Or if you easily imagine someone actually wanting to use one of these things to make them on the side of the So they train it to do trains and, you know, and then if it has any ability to, for example, post things on the internet. But what's the difference between that and a simple rule based system that a human would write that could do the same thing? Because this could be faster, this might be smarter, or this might be. Well, uh, but, but the same human could, could write a system and inadvertently do the same thing without any of this. I don't think so. I mean, this is actually how they have flash crashes in the stock market where someone you know, screws up. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. But it's not just that you don't want to get in a situation where you, you, if someone is taking your. Artificial general intelligence apply it to the stock market, and then it does something you know very bad in, in the stock market or in uh, yeah. the real world. Maybe I have one more concrete question regarding this medium. How about the size? How do you find the size of the What is the maximum? Oh, as many as you want. And, 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 but at, at the more you add to it, the more computation is going to require. Computation or the, uh, the, the memory? The computation is in the temporal memory part of the algorithm. And for spatial pulling, you, you can pretend there's nothing in here for the spatial pulling part. These, these bits are just for, me, for temporal memory. Yeah, yeah that, uh, that's, that's what I'm asking for. So, it's uh, like limits or how big the structure be? structure yeah, yeah. Um, Why is the effectivity of this? Now, there's, there's limits. So we typically make them 2,000 mini columns. We've never had to make them anymore. Or any of our I don't think we've ever done anything bigger than that. Uh, but it depends on how big the space is. I mean, the bigger the spa this space is, I, theoretically, the bigger you'll have to make things with your space. But once we get to these parallel, you know, you're going to have one section of cortex processing a section over here, and then another beside it potentially processing another. Yeah, that could be some side. There might be a little bit of overlap there. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah. I was just afraid if there is any, 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 any yeah. other so no, we were trying to thank you. So are these things related to those 150,000 vertical columns, or is that totally different? They're sort of related, but they're different. They're different things. Here's, I would draw, here's a cortical column. Say one is 150,000 or whatever, cortical columns. And, and this is separated out into layers. And, and within one of these layers, there will be many columns. And um, most likely, they, they stretch through the whole cortical column, all of them stretch through the whole cortical column. Although we have trouble seeing the many columns in some of the layers. Some of them, we can't see them. But it looks as if they stretch through all of them. Um, so we're simulating like this bit. We're just simulating one of these layers. So these mini column activations very likely have effects in, in other layers, have, have some way of taking this activation and representing something else down here. 
we have, we, I, I think this has something to do with grid style modules or other types of orientation location slash modules that are somehow in sync with sensory input, but that's still research and I don't understand it. From this excuse me, from this cortical column to the other cortical column, how are those connecting? So, so that's in our, another paper that is that's called why. Uh, 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 just go to mentalcom slash papers. <laughs> it's the one about that says columns in the title. So. And in some of these areas, generally, well, this is, this is sort of the, the model we like to run. We'll, we'll take two layers in one, in one sort of model. Um, uh, one we we'll call this sort of a, a layer that gives just the input with any models. And then another one up here that uh, this is from paper, that's so sort of an object pooling layer. And, and it's based on the movement, in this case, and this represents like location and sensor input. And this is where the, the permanent object is represented over time. So for example, as I move my finger across, through this object reference space, I'm feeling the sensor, sensory information and location information process here. And I'm the representation that represents a racer as I'm doing this is in another layer. Okay. And this is happening in every cortical column, even the ones that aren't directly involved in sensing this. Like this, this inner cortical column is, is also part of that representation. And I know what it feels like doing that. I know what all of it. I know what this, all of this would feel like. So I can represent this object as a sensory feature in an allocentric as a collection of sensory features in an allocentric space, no matter how I touch it or interact with it with my body. So, and all of these columns that are doing this have different unique representations in this object pooling layer. So each one, even if we're right beside each other, are going to have representations here that are different, that are incomparable. However, these guys stretch laterally to share with each other. So all of these are not only sharing information um, temporally, so over time they know what they're touching over time, these are also transmitting their, their representations to neighboring columns and stretch more on the neuron here over here. And this is an actual uh, distal connection. So now these are all proximal connections. And if you get to the temporal memory section, we talk about distal connections. Um, typically, temporal memory means a distal connection back to itself, back to the same layer. So these are contexts to the past. Right, because this connection is leading to a connection that existed before in the same place. Or you can get that distal information from another place. And in this case, we're going to go. We're getting this, this layer that represents an object that is under attention, that's being attended to, is getting information about what, it's, what, it, what was represented in the past, as well as what other columns that are sending it to my eyes, my ears, I can hear that too. All of those contribute across the whole person and allow with these lateral connections to share that object information and spread it sort of across the whole all the whole so manner. Each of these each of these layers has a ground or object. Well, each of these vertical columns has a ground and we think the same process is happening. There's there's two of these loops. We don't know all of this, okay? But this is this is one one loop. There's another loop like right here. Uh, there's almost the exact same thing. Where there's an object representation here, and then there's a, a very transient representation here. I think there's probably last I heard the talk about this is like orientation. There's maybe an orientation part of this loop, and another one is about location, and somehow they stick together so that you can take an object and frame it in the way that you want in any location. Yeah. Yeah. This is a yeah. I was going to ask, how yeah. how an object or concept apples? How would that fit? Well, you've you've um, received thousands of apples in your life, right? So you think of an apple, it's easy to do. You think of an apple, you probably have like a quintessential example of a red apple or whatever in your head. So the idea, yeah, you can imagine. Touching the apple, you know what it feels like, you know what it tastes like, you know what it sounds like, you know what it is. You've got a representation of an apple all over your cortex. 
I you know, you know, you know, probably never done this before, but you know, what exactly that's what it would be like when you put it on the bottom of your stuff. Because the, 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 the portable columns uh, for the, in the sensory part of your brain are modeling an apple. Even if they've never interacted directly with an apple, they can still model an apple. Um, so you've got an apple model all throughout your brain that is abstract enough that if you reached into a box and you didn't know what something was and you grabbed it, the apple, you would almost immediately know what it was because all of the sensory, all of you've grabbed an apple so many million times in your hand, um, it would it would snap to what feels like that in space. You know, there are only a few things, apple being one of them. So when you said all across the brain, what you said, this theory is not just other theories I've seen, like normal correlates or whatever, like a grandmother's style or like a characteristic example. Does it matter or is it shooting in a different way? No, there's, so I don't think grandmother cells jive with this. Uh, that, that meaning that there's particular cells that activate in, for specific criteria, maybe not nothing else. I don't think it's appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that cell would be a Beyonce cell and a hundred other things. And they, they, when they find the Beyonce cells, it's because they're looking for one thing. But that cell probably activates for a hundred other things too, because it's all distributed. And so this, the apple, all the neurons that fire in your brain when you think about apple will fire in your brain when you think about other things. So is the concept of the collection of, is it like a group of parallel cells then? Is it that together the shooting activations is that uh, combined? No, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, so I think you can think of, I, I don't know, getting, yeah. I think you mentioned that the, 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 Because they're doing a different function, 
yeah. in the same layer. So like this, this specifically is like there's a loop here, layer five, layer six B, and, and layer two, three, two, layer six A. Those are the, these two particle loops that we talk about in our papers. But, um, and was this is it a two thousand of these of these things? Many columns. Many columns. That's what we model, yeah. But uh and it's oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 right. sorry? Did you transit? No, I'll be okay. <laughs> So have you seen these people who estimate how many you know, terabytes of storage is in the human Oh, no, we don't get into that. You don't believe that? No, no, no. It's because there's so much redundancy. I mean, yeah, yeah, you could say that there's that much if you count every snaps and every connection, but that's not how your brain works. Your, your brain is super redundant. I mean, you can, you can go in and kill a bunch of your neurons and wake up the next day and you don't even notice. So I mean, a lot of those pathways are completely gone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for coming here. Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, take them up. Take them up, guys. Um, just yes, a couple of questions. I didn't mind that. Oh, I think you did just because you made so many simulations. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right. Like all of our research is simulations. Uh, uh, well, some of them are. There's a lot of prototypes that are graphical, just to figure out things, but mostly they're, they end up making charts for papers. Uh, but, but our papers do have. We have a repository of HTML papers with, with code. Yeah, Thanks for sticking this thing out. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I'm glad you got a copy. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure if that was some gay experiment you laid out for grids or something, or if it was actually just marker. Yeah. People like the cups. So. Yeah, no. yeah. I figured they'd all be gone. Oh, well, I got to get mine. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thanks again for the. You're welcome. Thanks for the idea. So glad, glad you brought it up because we haven't done this in a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Alright. I'm gonna. I was mad that you you guys get bugs. Bye. Bye, you guys. I think I'm gonna shut this off. It's 10 o'clock here, so everybody take care. Um, I I think I'm streaming Friday. Take care.